What is the truth about Buddhism and Hinduism? Today we're going to be talking about and uncovering the mysteries behind Buddhism and Hinduism and also sharing with you some things you might have not known about these two religions along with going over the pagan origins along with tying in religions such as Taoism, Sikhism, Jainism, and a few others. We will be going over their different types, the histories behind them, the origins, and also sharing with you the truth about them because the truth will be revealed to you today. Now on this network, we've covered the origins of Christianity and Islam in detail. And now in this video particularly, we're going to be focusing on major Asian religions specifically because now it's Asia's turn. Now I understand that there are several types of Buddhism and Hinduism depending on which nation you go to and depending on the country. So for example, there are different types of Buddhism in China versus if you were to go to Thailand. Or there's different types of even Hinduism if you were to go to India in different parts versus even in Nepal. However, we're going to be going over a brief academic overview of these different Eastern religions and also in this this video particularly we're going to be sharing with you some of the similarities and how similar they are along with some of the differences but once again this is going to be a brief academic overview and we're going to be looking at this from a scholarly and an academic standpoint now it says here the eastern religions are religious philosophies originating from the eastern world such as east south and southeast asia this region is the place where the biggest religions of the world were born and we're also going to be taking a look at some of their symbolisms too the biggest and most popular eastern Eastern religions are Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. But there are some more that you might not have heard about before. Now we're going to briefly go over these again. Hinduism is also known as the oldest religion of the plain, which is still practiced today. It originates from the Indian subcontinent, so countries today such as Bhutan, Nepal, and India. Hinduism has the biggest history of all the other Eastern religions. It has a massive amount of religious texts and scriptures. The most important being the Vedas and the Upanishads. Hindus worship thousands of deities and we'll be covering this later on in the video to come but the most important are Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu. We'll also be talking about that too. Now this right here is the symbol for Hinduism up here as you can see but if we keep going then we go to Buddhism which was born around 500 BCE. The founder of Buddhism is said to be Siddhartha Gautama. He became Buddha after years of spiritual practices. His journey started when he first faced the suffering of his people. Then he left his family and gave up all his material possessions in search for answers. Ultimately, he reached enlightenment under a Bodhi tree. Then he started to share his knowledge, allowing others to find enlightenment also. You can see this with the wheel right here, which we'll also be talking about in Buddhism. Then there's Jainism, where just like Buddhism is a religion that was founded under Buddhism, Jainism was founded by Mahavira. He was a powerful spiritual teacher and enlightened one. And was the 24th teacher of the Jain principles and philosophies. Although the followers of Jainism believe in reincarnation, they believe that they can avoid it only by strict ethical behavior and reincarnation also can mean rebirth or reincarnating as another person, animal, etc. Then it goes on to say their goal is to have a pure jiva or soul. Sikhism began in the northern region of India. The founder of Sikhism is Guru Nanak Dev, whom was followed by other nine gurus. Sikhs believe in one supreme deity, the only creator. The one deity who created everything, protects everything, and destroys everything. Everything. The spiritual scriptures of Sikhism are called the Guru Granth Sahib, which contain the teachings of each guru, including the first one, Guru Nanak Dev. Now this hand symbol right here, as you can see, this is the hand symbol for Jainism, and then this is the symbol for Sikhism. Now if you keep going to Eastern religions, this is what you get, which is Taoism, also known as Taoism right here, which is the yin and the yang. It says, this religion has so many sects that it is hard to be defined. 
Although the basis of the Taoist philosophies is the same, the fundamentals of the religion are the three jewels of the Tao, which are love, moderation, and humility. Traditional Taoism is polytheistic, which means multiple deities are worshipped, but it has numerous monotheistic sects, or the belief and worship of one deity. The central deity on Taoism is the Jade Emperor. Shinto is the Japanese religion. The Japanese word Shinto means the way of the deities. The core values of Shinto are respect for tradition, family, nature, cleanliness, and ritual observation. Although Shinto is a separate religion, it is highly influenced by Buddhism and Taoism. And in fact, in Japan, more than a third of people there are in fact Buddhists or identify as some form of Buddhism. Hence, many Shintoists considering themselves also Buddhists. Just as Taoism, Shinto also has numerous sects. Folk Shinto focuses on shamanism and faith healing, which has to do with uh, energies and also spiritual energies, and we're going to be talking more about that when it comes to chakras. On the other hand, sect Shinto's followers worship mountains, and that's another thing we're going to be talking about in this video, animal and nature worship, along with exposing it too. Now, the interesting thing when it comes to Buddhism is that one can identify as a Buddhist and also an atheist too. And later on, we will go over the different forms and types of Buddhism because indeed some forms of Buddhism is no belief in an actual creator, but rather is what both Buddhism and atheists. Then finally, there is Confucianism right here. Though many think it is not a religion, it works as a religious philosophy. Confucianism contains a complex system of moral, social, and political dogma, appearing more as an ethical system instead of a religious belief. The cores of Confucianism are duty, loyalty, and humaneness, although it allows people to believe in ghost spirits and certain deities, but only to respect these entities and not to worship them. In conclusion, the Eastern religions are numerous, the seven being the most popular among them. Each of these religions has their own sects and branches, which makes them more complex and numerous, but they all have something in common, and they originate from East, South, and Southeast Asia, and we're going to be going over some more commonalities between them. Now we're going to go over the different types of Buddhism specifically for this video and then looking at some of the Buddhist beliefs and traditions. Now it says there are four of Buddhism's most prominent sects and here is an introductory information. Now there's Theravada which is the most ancient form of Buddhism and is the dominant school in Southeast Asia in places such as Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, and Laos. Its name translates to Doctrine of the Elders and it centers around the Pali scriptures transcribed from the oral tradition taught by the Buddha. By studying these ancient texts, meditating and following the Eightfold Path, which is what that wheel represents, Theravada Buddhists believe they will achieve enlightenment. Strong emphasis is also placed on the monastic community and on heeding the advice of the discerned. Then there's also Mahayana Buddhism, which developed out of the Theravada tradition roughly 500 years after the Buddha attained so-called enlightenment. A number of individual schools and traditions have formed under the banner of Mahayana, including Zen Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Pure Land Buddhism, and Tantric Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism focuses on the idea of compassion and touts bodhisattvas, and forgive me if I'm butchering that, which are beings that work out of compassion to liberate other sentient beings from their suffering as central devotional figures. And then there's the third one, which is Vajrayana, which was the last of the three ancient forms to develop and provides a quicker path to enlightenment than either the Theravada or Mahayana schools. They believe that the physical has an effect on the spiritual and that the spiritual in turn affects the physical. Vajrayana Buddhists encourage rituals, chanting, and tantra techniques along with the fundamental understanding of Theravada and Mahayana schools as the way to attain enlightenment. And in this video, we're going to be covering some of these things, not just in Buddhism, but also in other religions such as Hinduism. And we're going to be sharing the similarities between those things. But this is the one that most is attributed to paganism. And then finally, there's also Zen Buddhism, which is said to have originated in China with the teachings of the monk Bodhidharma. 
Zen Buddhism treats Zazen meditation and daily practice as essential for attaining enlightenment and de-emphasizes the rigorous study of scripture. And then I'm going to add a fifth one, which is secular Buddhism or atheistic Buddhism, which is basically just Buddhism, which is ways of attaining enlightenment and things like that, but without the belief of a creator. Now, technically, Buddhism is more of a philosophy of life and is more philosophical than it is actually religious, but it claims that the teachings of the Buddha are aimed solely at liberating sentient beings from suffering, and this is according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees site that talks more about this religion, again, from an academic standpoint. The basic teachings of Buddha, which are core to Buddhism, are, one, the three universal truths, according to them, the four noble truths, and the Noble Eightfold Path. So it says here the three universal truths are nothing is lost in the universe, everything changes, the law of cause and effect. Now, of course, in Buddhism, there's the law of karma, which says for every event that occurs, there will follow another event whose existence was caused by the first, and this second event will be pleasant or unpleasant according as its cause was skillful or unskillful. Therefore, the law of karma teaches that the responsibility for unskillful actions is borne by the person who commits them. Now, all of this I will link in the description box so you can learn more on your own time. But again, we're just briefly going over these things. And for those who are Hindu and Buddhist, well, you probably already know all of this. But the three trainings or practices when it comes to Buddhism, these three consist of sila or virtue, good conduct, and morality based on two fundamental principles. The principle of equality, that all living entities are equal, or the principle of reciprocity, which is the golden rule in Christianity to do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you found in all major religions. Then there's the Samadhi, which focuses on concentration, meditation, and mental development. Developing one's mind is the path to discernment, which in turn leads to personal freedom. Mental development also strengthens and controls our mind. This helps us maintain good conduct. And then there's Prajna, which is discernment, insight, wisdom, or enlightenment. This is the real heart of Buddhism. Wisdom will emerge if your mind is pure and calm. And again, this is what Buddhism teaches. The first two paths listed in the Eightfold Path described below refer to discernment. The last three belong to concentration. The middle three are related to virtue. But now to get a better understanding, we will also talk about the Four Noble Truths because the Buddhist Four Noble Truths, according to them, explore human suffering. But it says they may be described somewhat simplistically as dukkha. Suffering exists. Life is suffering. Suffering is real and almost universal. Suffering has many causes, loss, sickness, pain, failure, and the impermanence of pleasure. Number two is samudaya, which there is a cause of suffering. Suffering is due to a attachment. It is the desire to have and control things. It can take many forms, craving of sensual pleasures, the desire of fame, the desire to avoid unpleasant sensations like fear, anger, or jealousy. And then there's Narodha, which is there is an end to suffering. Attachment can be overcome. Suffering ceases with the final liberation of Nirvana or Nibbana. The mind experiences complete freedom, liberation, and non-attachment. It lets go of any desire or craving and then Maga, in order to end suffering, you must follow the Eightfold Path. There is a path for accomplishing this according to Buddhist teachings. Here's the Eightfold Path right here. And again, this goes over the four core values that we've already talked about, the noble ones, where Pana is discernment and wisdom. There is first the Samaditi, which is right understanding of the four noble truths. Right view is the true understanding of the four noble truths. Then there's Sama Sankapa, which is right thinking, following the right path in life. Right aspiration is the true desire to free oneself from attachment, ignorance, and hatefulness. These two are referred to as Prajna or wisdom. Then there's sila, virtue or morality. There's samavaka, right speech, no lying, criticism, condemning, gossip, harsh language. Right speech involves abstaining from lying, gossiping, or hurtful talk. Then there's also sama kamanta, which is right conduct or right action, involves abstaining from hurtful behaviors such as killing, stealing, and careless sex. These are called the five precepts. Sama ajiva, right livelihood, support yourself without harming others. Right 
livelihood means making your living in such a way as to avoid dishonesty and hurting others, including animals. These three are referred to as shila or morality, and then there's also from the samadhi concentration or meditation for the final three, which says, Samavayama, right effort, promote good thoughts, conquer evil thoughts, right effort is a matter of exerting oneself in regards to the content of one's mind. Bad qualities should be abandoned and prevented from arising again. Good qualities should be enacted and nurtured. Then there's Samasati, right mindfulness, become aware of your body, mind, and feelings. Right mindfulness is the focusing of one's attention on one's body, feelings, thoughts, and consciousness in such a way as to overcome craving, hatred, and ignorance. And then finally, Sama Samadhi, right concentration. Meditate to achieve a higher state of consciousness. Right concentration is meditating in such a way as to progressively realize a true understanding of imperfection, impermanence, and non-separateness. There are, however, many sects of Buddhism, and there are different kinds of Buddhist monks all over the world. And of course, there are many differences, but we're just going over some of the main ones to get a better idea. So basically, the whole purpose of Buddhism specifically is ways to live in order to achieve enlightenment or nirvana. Now, there's also the five precepts. These are rules to live by. They're somewhat analogous to the second half of the Ten Commandments. Do you see that? The part of the Decalogue which describes behaviors to avoid. However, they are recommendations, not commandments. Believers are expected to use their own intelligence in deciding exactly how to apply these rules. Do not kill do not steal, do not lie, do not misuse sex, and really it should be do not murder. For monks and nuns, this means any departure from complete celibacy. For the laity, adultery is forbidden along with any sexual harassment or exploitation, including that within marriage. The Buddha did not uh, discuss consensual premarital sex within a committed relationship. Thus, Buddhist traditions differ on this. Most Buddhists, probably influenced by their local cultures, condemn same-sex sexual activity regardless regardless of the nature of the relationship between the people involved, and then do not consume alcohol or other drugs. Do you see where this is coming from? Pay very careful attention because where is Buddha getting all of this from? Buddha's getting it from the teachings of the scriptures, is getting it from the Yaudium, the ancient Hebrew culture, and then of course adding their own. Do you see where a lot of this is coming from? And then also, those preparing for monastic life or who are not within a family are expected to avoid an additional five activities, taking untimely meals, dancing, singing, music, or watching grotesque mime, use of garlands, perfumes, and personal adornment, use of high seats, and accepting gold or silver. So you see these rules right here, these five rules up here, they sound like what? The Ten Commandments, adding and taking away. They get it from what? They get it from Exodus chapter 20. They get it from the scriptures themselves. That's where they get it from. That's where it originates from. And by the way, the Buddhist monks that remain celibate, this is no different than Catholic priests. Do you see how it's exactly the same thing there? One similarity to another religion. Then there's also the texts that come and stem from these different religions. Now, again, we're not going to go over all of this, but I just wanted to share this with you about Buddhist texts, how they were initially passed on orally by monks. So you see that a lot of these texts were passed down by tradition. And then not only that, but even with the Hindu texts too, because their manuscripts and historical literature related to any of the diverse traditions within Hinduism. Why am I highlighting that? You'll find out in a moment to come. Now, interestingly enough, there are two historic classification of Hindu texts. There's the Shruti, with that which is heard, and the Smriti, that which is remembered. Now, some of them include the four Vedas, including the four types of embedded texts, the Samhitas, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas, and the early Upanishads. Now, many of these texts were composed in Sanskrit, which is an ancient Indian language. 
And we're not going to go over all of them, but briefly you'll see that Hinduism have many sacred documents, but no single sacred text such as the scriptures. There are five primary sacred texts of Hinduism, each associated with the stage of Hinduism's evolution. The Vedic verses written in Sanskrit between 1500 to 900 BCE, the Upanishads written between 800 and 600 BCE, the Laws of Manu written around 250 BC, the Ramayana, and then the Mahayana. Habarata. And this was a time when Hinduism was popularized for the masses. Hindu cosmology is explained in the Vedas and while the Upanishads provide a theoretical basis for this cosmology. Now, interestingly enough, you'll see with traditions such as Lokayata, Karvaka, Ajivika, Buddhism, and Jainism, they did not regard the Vedas as authorities. They're referred to as heterodox or non-orthodox schools. Now, it's interesting that what even the Vedas, they're what? They're based on traditions. Now we're going to go over a few terms that's seen within multiple religions and you'll see the similarities because now we're going to go over moksha, which is a term in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism, which refers to various forms of emancipation, enlightenment, liberation, and release. Now in the senses, it refers to freedom from samsara, which we're going to go over the cycle of death and rebirth. Now pay careful attention how it says moksha refers to freedom from ignorance self-realization, self-actualization, and self-knowledge. Now in Hinduism, traditionally speaking, it's a central concept and the utmost aim to be attained through three paths during human life. These three paths are Dharma, which we're going to go over, virtuous, proper, moral life, Artha, material prosperity, and Kama, pleasure, sensuality, and emotional fulfillment. Together, they're called Purusartha, and some of the schools in Indian religions, moksha is considered equivalent to and used interchangeably with other terms such as these ones and nirvana also. And you see these terms used interchangeably in some of the religions. But notice how all of this has to do with what? Self. It has to do with self and what? A cycle. It's like a what? A cycle of things. Pay very careful attention because it's going to be very important. Now, nirvana itself is used more in Buddhism, and you'll see that it can mean literally blown out as an oil lamp, interestingly enough. It's commonly associated with Jainism and Buddhism and represents its ultimate state, the liberation from repeated rebirth in samsara, and nirvana is synonymous in Indian religions with moksha and mukti. Nirvana is considered to be a state of perfect quietude, freedom, highest happiness, as well as the liberation from or ending of samsara, the repeating cycle of birth, life, and death. And then there's also this right here, which is dharma. Now this varies among all of the different religions, but this is a key concept with multiple meanings in Indian religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and others. There's no single word translation for Dharma in Western languages. Now in Hinduism, Dharma signifies behaviors that are considered to be in accord with Vrata, or the order that makes life and universe possible, including duties, rights, laws, conduct, virtues, and quote-unquote right way of living. Now in Buddhism, Buddhism, Dharma means cosmic law and order and is also applied to the teachings of the Buddha. And then it goes on to say Dharma and Jainism refers to the teachings of Tirthankara and the body of doctrine pertaining to the purification and moral transformation of human beings. So it talks about what? Transformation cycles. For Sikhs, the word Dharma means the path of righteousness and proper religious practice. Now we're going to go over these symbols and these hand gestures in a moment to come because when it talks about rituals and rites of passage, well, who exactly are you actually worshiping when it comes to yoga and personal behaviors? What are you actually inviting into your being and into your soul when you do these things such as meditation and tantras and mantras and stuff? And then when it comes to the hand gesture, what is this really referring to and who is this really paying homage to? 
And then there's karma, which of course means action, work, or deed, referring to the spiritual principle of cause and effect where intent and actions of an individual can influence the future of that individual between a cause and effect. And this is seen in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and also in Taoism too. Now you see the endless knot right here and how the endless knot is shown on the Nepalese temple a prayer wheel right here. You see that and then you also see right here the karmic knot depicted on the chest right here of Tirthankara right there which is said to be a spiritual teacher in Jainism but the reason I'm showing you this is because what this type of teaching is what endless you're never going to actually reach something that you're trying to reach because it's always going to be endless it's always going to be a non-stop thing you're always going to be bound by this when it comes to these rules that were not given by the creator but rather by man and even demons too because then it talks about the prayer wheel when it comes to these traditions oral traditions orally reciting prayers where else do you see something like this in Judaism with oral teachings from what the Babylonian Talmud and then what we just went over with samsara also which is what the karmic cycle reincarnation and cycle of aimless drifting wandering or mundane existence now this of course is what used in order to reach nirvana in order to reach enlightenment but don't you see that this is a never-ending cycle it's an endless knot it's religion you're constantly bound to this the karmic cycle in samsara is like moving in a circuit it's like moving on a hamster wheel you're moving and moving constantly trying to reach enlightenment and then possibly having to start all over again what are you really trying to reach what are you really trying to get enlightenment from are the questions that also is what is the Buddhist wheel represent it represents a never-ending cycle religion being constantly bound to something and not really fully understanding what you're being bound to or what you're inviting into your being when you participate and partake in meditations and etc but now that you have a basic foundation and understanding of these religions now we're going to go over and talk about the truth about them and cover and expose some things you might not have known and in this video also we're going to emphasize the importance of names and talk about that because just like we talked about in our Christian video and in our Islam video names are very important now I know this has a ton of significance when it comes to the Eastern culture and even in Eastern traditions and just etiquette in general so it's more respected but what names represent importance they represent the character of someone names represent who a person is a name represents represents not only the identity of a person but it tells you the culture the heritage it tells you the language of a person it tells you a person's personality and who that person is why is this very important and why am I even bringing it up in this video because think about it this way if your name is Shreya or Vishal that is going to be your name and let's just assume for the purposes of this video that your name is in Hindi well that is going to be your Hindi name no matter what so if you decide to go to China or Thailand or Cambodia or Laos or anywhere else in the world you're going to have the same name no matter what so if you decide to go to China and they start speaking Chinese well they're still going to refer to you as Shreya or Vishal they're not going to change that there might be a Chinese equivalent of your name however they're not going to refer to you by that Chinese equivalent because if they did that would not be your name just like with John the French equivalent is Johan but if you start calling someone by the name of John Johan he's more than likely not going to respond the same is true if your name is Wang Li or Jack Gri well guess what that is always going to be your name if you have a Chinese name that is always going to be your name in the Chinese language no matter where you go if you have a Thai name and it's Jack Gri that's all always going to be your Thai name no matter what or if your name is Gamya Gamya in the Hindi you hear the Ya there that's always going to be your name no matter what it's never going to change please keep this in mind for the duration of the video to come 
Oh, but you can't have history without symbolism. And like I said, the purpose of this video is to show you where this comes from and where this originates from because so many people have no idea where all this thought and where this mystery thought comes from. And so it's my job to help you understand where this comes from and, what, and what's really behind all this. And I'm trying to approach it from all angles as best as I can. But it says, according to Third Eye Pine Cones, it says, history and symbolism. Throughout the span of recorded human history, pine cones have served as a symbolic representation of human enlightenment, the third eye, and the pineal gland. That's what you've been told. But it goes on to say conifer pine trees are one of the most ancient plant genera on the plain, having existed nearly three times longer than all flowering plant species. The pine cone is the evolutionary precursor to the flower, and its spines spiral in a perfect Fibonacci sequence in either direction, much like the sacred geometry of a rose or a sunflower, or what geometria, here we go again, let's keep going. Our pineal gland, shaped like and named after the pine cone, is at the geometric center of our brain and is in intimately linked to our body's perception of light. The pineal modulates our wake-sleep patterns and circadian rhythms, remains uniquely isolated from the blood-brain barrier system, and receives a higher percentage of blood flow than any other area of the body save the kidneys. It is considered to be many to be our biological third eye, the seat of the soul, epicenter of enlightenment, and a sacred symbol throughout history and cultures around the world has been the pine cone. But is this part true? Let's keep going. Now let's get into some history, because as you see, it's all embedded with the pine cone. Let's, let's go to what it says. The Egyptian staff of Osiris, which we just talked about, which you can see right here, uh, dating back to approximately 1224 BC, depicts two intertwining serpents rising up to meet at a pine cone. Why do you think there are serpents here? Let's keep going. Modern scholars and philosophers have noted the staff's symbolic parallels to the Indian Kundalini, a spiritual energy in the body depicted as coiled serpents rising up from the base of the spine to the third eye pineal gland in the moment of enlightenment. Two serpents rising up? If you, this should be ringing some real alarm bells if you, if you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who really know what this can really uh, implicate. It goes on to say, Awakened Kundalini represents the merging and alignment of the chakras and is said to be the one and only way to attain the divine wisdom, bringing pure joy, pure knowledge, and pure love. With serpents, though? Let's keep going. Depicting of Hindu deities are also interwoven with both literal and symbolic representations of serpents, serpents and pine cones. And we see that with who? Shiva. In some cases, Hindu gods are carved, sculpted, or drawn holding a pine cone in outstretched hand. Shiva, the most prominent god in the Hindu tradition, is consistently depicted with the head or coiled hair, shaped in marked similarity to a pine cone and interwoven with the serpent or serpent. So you can see the serpent here, the serpent's there, and he looks like the shape of a pine cone on his head. And this, of course, was the Tammuz right here, and here's some other statues as well, and ancient uh, symbolisms with this. Uh, but it goes on, it says, in addition to spiritual consciousness and enlightenment, pine cones have also historically, now this is a historical fact, been used as symbols of everlasting or eternal life knowledge the tree of knowledge let's keep going ancient assyrian palace carvings dating back to 713 to 716 bc depict four winged godlike figures purposefully holding aloft pine cones or in some cases using a pine cone to pollinate their depiction of what the tree of life adam and eve is this all starting to make sense i hope so a tribute, perhaps, to both the pine cone's immortality symbolism and its role as an icon of enlightenment. People, I hope your eyes are awoke. You're both your eyes and not just one of them because I'm telling you, there's real, real serious implications behind this. But it goes on to say, in yet another culture's tribute to the pine cone as symbolic of spiritual ascension and immortality, a statue of the Mexican god, and I'm not even going to try to uh, pronounce it, but it means seven snakes, again depicts the deity offering forth pine cones in one hand and an evergreen tree in the other. Evergreen. Where do we see evergreen trees? On Christmas, which gives homage to Nimrod. Mystery Babylonian religion. Let's keep going. 
The Greeks and Romans also incorporated the pine cone into their elaborate systems of religious belief and mythology. Dionysus, later known as Bacchus to the Romans, was continually depicted carrying a, a, thri a thrysis or a fennel staff woven with ivy and leaves and toppled with a pine cone that looks very similar to this as well as this. You can see the pine right there. The thyrus, uh, purported to drip with honey, was regulated was regularly used Slachia, as a sacred instrument at religious uh, rituals and feeds. Romans later built an enormous bronze sculpture, the pigna, in the shape of a huge pine cone, three stories tall. According to a popular medieval legend, the, scul the sculpture uh, stood on top of the pantheon as a lid for the round opening in the center of the building's vault. The pigna is confirmed to have served as a large fountain overflowing with water next to the who? Temple of Isis? Temple of Ishtar or Easter? In ancient Rome, however, the gigantic statue now sits directly in front of the, where does it stand today? The Catholic Vatican in the court of the pine cone. I hope you're seeing where this comes from. Of course, it talks about the Catholic uh, religious tradition is interwoven with pine cones. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We see that with the Pope as well. We see that with the papacy. It also gives what the illumination in the church, where all this comes from, the awakening of the pineal gland. Yeah, that's what they want you to believe. This article goes on to talk about how the pine... The pineal gland. Yeah, that's what they want you to believe. This article goes on to talk about how the pine cone is also embedded in symbolisms as well throughout religious symbols and not just Hinduism and Buddhism, but also throughout world religions worldwide. And I just shown you earlier that it appears not only in um, Assyrian uh, hieroglyphics as well as statues, but also in ancient Roman and Greek statues. And we saw it with the staff of Osiris, Egyptian as well, but it's also in Freemasonic buildings as well, because pine cones are also placed in Freemason octagons on the ceilings of Masonic lodges. So it's also embedded with Freemasonry as well, all the mystery religion. And we can see this as a religious symbol as well, just like the swastika, the Christian cross, the all-seeing eye. It's the same thing. I hope you're seeing this because there's a real bigger implication with this. And there's a reason I'm talking about this. And you may be wondering how this relates to the third eye. You're about to find out. Now we're going to start getting into the spiritual implications of the third eye and where this really comes from. Because I need you to see where this comes from and that this is nothing new. And what they're telling you is complete lies. That this come, that there's a real history behind all this. And I hope you're seeing it. But this says, and I'll make sure to leave the links below. The pine cone symbol is one of the most mysterious emblems found in ancient and modern art and architecture, just as we went over. Few scholars realize it, but the pine cone alludes to the highest degree of spiritual illumination possible and we're going to talk about that as well this was recognized by various ancient cultures and the symbol can be found in the ruins of the indonesians babylonians egyptians greeks romans and christians to name a few and we just we went over the babylonians uh with tammuz we went over the egyptians with osiris and the staff we went over the greeks and the romans with dionysus as well as being on roman carvings and the christians with the vatican it, well let's keep going it also appears in the drawings of esoteric traditions like freemasonry and we just went over that theosophy gnosticism and esoteric christianity the pine cone held the same meaning for all it symbolized the secret vestigal organ the pineal gland or the third eye that we all possess that is that that is what this is taught in all of these traditions and esoteric beliefs and all of them this is what it's taught in religion and we're going to see more of that but it, it, you, i want you to see the pictures where it shows all of this and it shows it here uh, uh, in uh, symbolism all over cambodia uh, we see it there in the angkor wat uh, we also see it, of course, I just showed you this in the Roman bronze sculpture, the pigna, the pine cone. We see it here, too. Like I said, the uh, staff of Osiris that was found in 1224 uh, BC. And then it goes into the third eye and pineal gland. But this is what I want you to see. It says, interestingly, the esoteric symbol of Kundalini Yoga, and that's what we were just talking about earlier, is the, the caduceus, a symbol that features two and antithetical serpents and as you can see this is the serpent symbol that's used in medical all over the place but it's also used where in kundalini yoga is that a coincidence it's not looking like it i hope you're starting to see 
where this is coming from. This is Kundalini is a spiritual energy or life force present in every human being located at the base of the spine. To awaken the third eye, the Kundalini energy must be summoned to the forehead where it expands and thus awakens the third eye. The energy is said to travel along the Ida left and a Pingala right up the central pole or a Shushumna. But as you can see, what are you really accessing here? I hope you're seeing that because if not, then I, I hope you're really seeing this stuff because it's real serious implications. And of course, we go back to the Sumerian god Marduk, uh, back to Tammuz, the right Dionysus, the Roman god with the uh, uh, pine cones. And we see pine cones all over the place in history. We see the third eye as well. And we're going to get into the eye of Horus or the eye of Ra the eye of the sun god as well and i'm going to talk about these things in just a moment uh to come like i said hopefully this is helping you see uh where this comes from from a different angle and from a different perspective and not just from the same watered down perspectives of religion and from the same watered down perspectives of other places but hopefully this is helping you see the whole picture and the full picture of where this comes from and i want you to know that it's nothing new this stuff has been going on for a long time but i want you to see what it's commonly associated with that is my goal and purpose of doing this so here i am at wikipedia that talks about the third eye and it says the third eye also known as the inner eye is a mystical and esoteric concept referring to a speculative invisible eye which provides perception beyond ordinary sight in certain dharmic uh, spiritual traditions such as hinduism the third eye refers to the anja or brow or chakra and theosophy is related to the pineal gland, which we just talked about. The third eye refers to the gate that leads to inner realms and spaces of higher consciousness. In New Age spirituality, the third eye often symbolizes a state of enlightenment or the evocation of mental images having deeply personal spiritual or psychological significance. The third eye is often associated with religious visions, clairvoyance, the ability to observe chakras and auras, precognition, and out-of-body experiences. People who are claimed to have the capacity to utilize their third eyes are sometimes known as seers. So we see exactly where it comes from. And it's also talked about in mostly embedded in Hinduism and Buddhism thought and uh, schools of thought. And we see a Cambodian Shiva head showing a third eye. But it's not just Shiva and it's not just uh, comes from Hinduism. It's Buddhism as well. Like I said, the idea of a third eye is nothing new. It comes from historical facts. It comes from all the mystery Babylonian religions, but it also comes from re world religions today, such as Bud Buddhism and Hinduism. And it's interesting when you try to tell people this stuff and they try to say, oh, don't bring up religion, though. Oh, don't bring up religion. Don't bring up religion. Yet they don't. Yet they're the same people who don't even understand that the third eye comes from religion. It comes from Hinduism and Buddhist thoughts and teachings. That's where it comes from, as well as being embedded in Freemasonry and mystery Babylonian religion. To talk about the third eye and to talk about the chakra, that is religion. And I hope people understand that when you bring that up, you're talking about religion when you bring that up because it's a religious thought. It's a it's a set of beliefs. That's what religion is. So let's get that clear. But here I am at Token Rock that talks more about the third eye and it says, the third eye is known as the gateway to higher consciousness. It may alternate alternately symbolize a state of enlightenment. In Eastern and Western spiritual traditions, the third eye is known as the inner eye, the mystical and esoteric concept referring to the Anja Chakra. The third eye is associated with clairvoyance, out-of-body experiences, visions, and pre precognition. People who have developed their third eye are known as seers. Hinduism and Buddhism use the third eye as symbolism of enlightenment just like the Illuminati, because the Illuminati means the enlightened ones. I hope you're seeing that. It says it is referred to as the eye of knowledge in Indian tradition, Gnosticism, knowledge, good and evil, Adam and Eve. Are you seeing where this is coming from? I hope so. East Asian and Indian iconography show the third eye as a dot i or mark interesting mark on the forehead of deities and other enlightened beings kind of like the mark of the beast almost if you want to put it that way hindus place a tillak between the eyebrows as a representation of the third eye so of course you can see that it, it it's embedded with hinduism 
and Buddhism as well. You can activate it through meditation and clairvoyance, according to it. And we know that the pineal gland, of course, that's where they where it comes from. But there is more to this than just what meets the eye. There's more to it than just what meets both eyes. And I hope your spiritual eyes are starting to awake to this because I'm telling you, this goes much deeper than you think. Like I said, because this is a truth network, my job is to expose everything. And that includes exposing the lies of religion. Because remember, this is all embedded in religion. So to say that, oh, well, accessing the third eye, that has nothing to do with religion. Yes, it does. It is religion. So let's keep that in mind. But this is according, uh, this says Buddha's third eye. And this is about Buddhism and the third eye and Buddhist belief and tradition. It says, you may have come across many Buddha statues and Buddha heads like this one in which a small hairy dot appears between the eyes of the figure. This particular dot is known to have existed in many statues and stupas in the iconography from different nations such as Nepal, India, Burma, Thailand, etc. So Eastern Asia. If we go through the teachings of the Buddha or the Buddhist teachings, hatred, delusion, clinging, and greed cause suffering in the world. The Eightfold Path of the Buddha has been a great way of ridding oneself of these traits and obtain a higher peace of one's life and reality. Of course, this is according to Buddhist teachings and beliefs. This is not my own because... But let's keep going. It says, belief of the third eye. In the same way, the dot, which represents the third eye of the Buddha for the Buddhists, was adopted by the followers of Buddhism as well as Hinduism and Taoism in various Asian countries. The Buddhists take the third eye as the symbol of spiritual awakening of knowledge and wisdom. While the Hindus have a belief of the third eye being a channel to the inner and hidden power, the Western symbolize the third eye as the symbol of second sight or clairvoyance so it represents all of that it represents the invisible eye which provides perception to the reality beyond ordinary vision of the people now mind you this is not according to me this is according to the buddhist belief and teachings i myself am not a buddhist nor am i hindu nor do i identify with any religion so let's just get that straight i am a follower of yahuwah and i expose the truth and expose lies for what they really are and expose religion as well but let's keep going now, it's no surprise that the third eye is also related and very similar to the all-seeing eye because in Freemasonic thought and in Freemasonry, the all-seeing eye is thought and even taught to be the eye that access knowledge and gives you knowledge when accessing it. So there is so there's no surprise or coincidences that it's all similar it all is the same thing embedded within the same thing and if you're not seeing that now with both eyes open i honestly don't know what to tell you because i'm telling you it's all stems from the same thing it all stems from the same esoteric thought from freemasonry from mystery babylonian religion it all comes from the same thing. It's nothing new. And all the New Age spiritualism comes from this, but whether you want to believe it or not. And I'm trying to get you to see that because I want you to see the bigger, more nefarious agenda behind all this and what you're really accessing if you try opening up this third eye. Chakras are connections between the physical and psychological bodies. They are situated in the spinal column, but their reflections can also be perceived as whirling discs in front of the body. As for the exact physical uh, location points in the body, there is much literature available that deals with this in detail. My reference is Kundalini Tantra by Swami uh, Satyananda, uh, Saraswati and all quotations are from this book so you can find more information on this book and we went over the kundalini and how that eerily represents serpents within the body of the DNA and so it goes on to talk about the Sanskrit word uh, mula means root or foundation it is that is precisely what the chakra is and it says uh, muladhara is at the root of the chakra system and its influences are at the root of our whole existence in tantra Muladhara is the seat of Kundalini, the basis from which the possibility of higher realization arises. This ordinary ego mind of Yasod works and runs of our lives more or less automatically. It is not until one takes steps towards spiritual development that this chakra awakens and its functions become conscious, which can be a painful experience. Why is it painful? Because what are you allowing to come in? What are you opening up yourself to if you're trying to access this third eye? I hope you're seeing the real implications and, to, and see something should be really alarming to you if you're really trying to wake up to truth 
is the fact that not only is this found in Freemasonic belief, this is also found in Egyptian belief. It's also found in all the ancient religions, but it's also found in Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and the Kabbalah. It's found in all of these ancient religions. That is where this stems from and comes from. So if that's not ringing some alarm bells to you by now, well, I seriously, honestly don't know what to tell you because willful ignorance is a real thing. But like I said, I'm trying my best to awaken you to truth. Like I said, you all need to be very careful when it comes to this type of stuff and when it comes to these types of teachings and these types of belief because if you're not getting the full scoop or if you're not getting the full scope of this, then you're just going to think that, oh, it's okay, that, oh, there's nothing really to it. When you don't even understand, even trying to access this, you're involving yourself with religion because this is found in hinduism buddhism taoism all the mystery religions and like i said what is this really accessing to what is this whole third eye what are you allowing to come into your body and into yourself and into your temple when you're trying to open up the third eye it even shows you right here right here it says the Cadesia staff carried by hermes in greek mythology in ancient rome it was depicted in the left hand of mercury right a visual representation of the practice of kundalini yoga the ultimate goal of which is to awaken the third eye hidden in the human forehead okay when you awaken it who are you really awakening to serpents who's a serpent satan i'm telling you i have not done a ton of videos on this but i want to cover this more in detail is that when you do certain things or when you allow your body to do certain things or to participate in certain things, you're opening up yourself to demons. And you may not want to believe that. You may not want to accept that as truth. But that is real truth, is that you're opening yourself up literally to serpents, to demons. If you even, just even the thought of it, you could be opening up yourself to allow demons into your house and into your temples when you're trying to access the third eye. That is just the truth because it even shows you right here. It even shows you serpents that were used by the ancients in Greek and Roman mythology back then. And, it's, and you even see it in symbolisms today. And I'm going to prove that to, uh, to you right now. Like I said, you see the third eye as well as in Freemasonry as well. And I'm going to prove that to you because it says in modern times, famous authors, painters, and poets have described the third eye and pineal gland as being nothing less than the lost secret of Freemasonry. In his 1918 book, The Wonders of the Human Body by Dr. George Washington Carey tells us, and quote, the all-seeing eye, this is the eye of Freemasonry, the third eye. While I am credibly formed that few Masons understand their own symbols, the fact remains that they use them. In her fascinating 1924 book, Mystic Americanism, the obscure American author Grace Morey explained the all-seeing eye, also emblematic of the pineal gland or third eye of the human being, has been found amid the ruins of every civilization upon the plain, thereby attesting the fact of a universal religion over all the earth at some remote period. Don't you see what this is? New Age Spiritualism, One World Religion. Don't you see where this comes from? Don't you see that the third eye is related to that? Freemasons have even admitted that the third eye comes from Freemasonic thought. It's a free, it comes from Freemasonry and it's used throughout Masonic decoration. I even showed you that of a church that even has the pine cone in it and the shape in it as well but but that's not all because it says a large masonic design on the side of the white hall building in the new york financial district depicts two enormous intertwining snakes spiraling up to a pine cone which is strikingly similar to the staff of osiris and you can see that uh, design right here and you can see a, a caduceus depicting a pine cone appears on the white hall building in New York City. Now, why would they have the pine cone symbolism, the wing symbolism, and the two serpents that you see on, on medicals everywhere, and what looks to be a sun right above it to represent sun worship, nature worship, serpents? Are you seeing this? Because they're even showing you right in front of you. And it goes on to say pine cones also adorn 
ritual instruments used by Freemasons inside Masonic lodges. The tops or points of the Masonic rods of deacons are often surmounted by a pine cone or pine apple. So it's embedded all over Freemasonry, all over the place. It's depicting the third eye, the eye of Horus, Freemasonry all over again. This goes all the way back to mystery Babylonian religion all over again. It has nothing to do with Yahuwah. It has nothing to do with righteousness. It has everything to do with esoteric Freemasonic religion. And if you don't know that now, well, now you do. But to conclude, the pine cone symbol then alludes to the third eye. It abounds in ancient art and architecture, a symbolic representation of our, our now dormant window to the world. While knowledge of the third eye and the practice of the awakening of the third eye continued strong in the east, it began to die down in the west because of uh, religions here. Consequently, secret societies like the Freemasons were established to protect third eye knowledge and, and to initiate new members into its wisdom to keep their practice alive. They don't want you to know this stuff. They want you to think that, oh, I can just access the third eye with no problem. Oh, if I just access the third eye, become one with myself and do the chakra and all that, and, you know, nothing's bad is going to happen to me. There's no religious implication with it. When doing so, you're participating in religion and you're allowing the demons to come into you because it even tells you that it's what? It's the sacred emblems in Freemasonry and they're trying to keep this stuff hidden from you. They don't want you to know the truth behind all this and I'm trying my best to wake you up to truth. And for those of you who are really righteous and who really want the truth and who want to seek righteousness, I highly suggest you do more research on this topic and come to your own conclusions because like I said, this goes much deeper than you think it does. This is why I'm telling all of you why language is so important. This is why the Hebrew is so important. This is why language itself is so important. And I'm going to keep reiterating that because you all need to seriously do your own research so you can see how important this really is. So you can stop sitting there and saying that, oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, we can call them whatever we want to. Because who are you really calling on when you use these words if you don't know the origin? and the etymology of these words but rather you don't even have to go do the research on your own because i'm already doing the research for you and putting it right in front of your face because i bet you also did not know that the word christ in the sanskrit means krishna and i'm not making this stuff up because i'm here at a sanskrit dictionary and as you can see i typed in the word christ itself so that you can see it and i'm translating it from english to sanskrit itself so you know i'm not making this stuff up and I'm going to leave the link below so you can see it. But as you can see, what is the close match of Christ? Christa. And if you look at the Greek from Christ, you see that in the Sanskrit, it matches what? Krishna. And that is exactly what that's talking about. And it even says Krishna, one of the names of the great teachers of India, classed as an avatar, his death in 3102 BC, marked the onset of the Kali Yuga or Dark Age. Gerald Massey and others equate him with Osiris, Horus and Christ. Did you see that? And we talked about Osiris with the religion commonly known as Mithraism and Mithras as well, and even Serapis, where we talked about Serapis Christus. That is where that word originates from. But we also see the word Christ in Sanskrit too. And, the, and of course, this is different from the word Mashiach, which is the Hebrew, which means anointed. This is something totally different, but you need to understand where all of this is coming from. Now I'm here at Krishna.com and the reason that I'm here is because I want to share this interview and conversation with you between a Hindu and a Christian and it even says that what Krishna or Christ the name is the same. Now I'm not going to go over all of this but I just want to let you see and let you see the conversation that what when the Hindus call on Krishna and when Christians call on Christ they're calling on the exact same thing. It's just the darn truth and that is what I'm trying to get you to see and this is why language is so important. Do you think it's a surprise or coincidence that both re are reverenced on December 25th with birthdays, both Krishna, the Hindu deity, and Jesus Christ as well. Do you really think that's a coincidence? Do you really think that, oh, that's just some made-up thing? I think not. Remember, that is what you must do. Ask questions. And I cannot stress that enough, the importance of asking questions. Because when you ask some serious questions, 
That is where you get some serious answers. I care more about your salvation than I do your feelings and your opinions right now. Because what am I showing you? I'm showing you what? Jesus and Krishna. Because I've already proven to you with scripture itself that A, the Messiah does not look like this because A, he has woolly hair, B, he has dark skin, and C, he was hung on a tree. So this right here does not even match the real Messiah. So the question you should be thinking about is if I've just proven that with scripture itself and that even in scripture that Jesus is not his name with the King James Version itself, where does this come from is the question. And is it a surprise or a coincidence that both Jesus and Krishna were said to be born on December 25th, even though the real Messiah was born nowhere near that? Their mothers, both of their mothers, are seen as holy virgins. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. But they are both also have something to do with a trinity, both Krishna and Jesus. And not only that, but both are said to be the Savior, even though the real name of the, the real Messiah, Yahusha, even though his name in the Hebrew means that Yah is salvation and that Yahuwah saves. So where is all of this coming from is the question. Because it's no surprise or coincidence that both of them make the same hand gestures. They both have the same sun symbols behind them. They both have the halos and everything is the exact same thing. Do you really think that's a coincidence? No, it is not. And trust me, it's not just them two. It's other ones as well, which I'm about to show you. And like I said, ask questions. Why do you think Jesus is always seen with the halo around him? Why do you think Krishna is always seen with the halo around him? Not only that, but why do you think they make the same exact hand gestures and hand movements and body motions? Why do you think that's the case? And why do you always see Jesus Christ holding up that hand gesture and this Masonic hand gesture right here too, which is the same Masonic hand gesture that looks very similar to Cesare Borgia? Why do you think that's the case? And who else holds up that exact same hand gesture? If you have not seen my image of the beast video, and if you have not seen my mark of the beast video, prepare to be blown away. Because what I'm about to show you in just a second is about to blow your mind away. You see the Trinity concept heavily embedded in pagan religions and in ancient religions. And you even see it in ancient Egyptian religion. And you even see what? Isis, Osiris, and Horus. And notice what they have, the sun symbol above the head. Do you really think that this is a coincidence? I'm telling you, you see it all over the place, embedded all over the place. And like I said, you see the sun symbol around. Nothing new is under the sun, not to mention the serpent above its head. What do you think it's really trying to show you and symbolize and why do you think in all of these ancient religions they all have some sun symbolism or some symbol of the sun embedded in their religion why do you see that with pictures abominable pictures by the way of Jesus Christ when the real Messiah doesn't even look like that do you really think that this is a coincidence I think not, because here I am showing you the Hindu trinity, and as you can see, this is the Hindu trinity from left to right. We have Brahma, who is said to be the creator, and we have Vishnu, who's said to be the preserver, as well as Shiva, the destroyer, and you see Shiva with CERN. Yes, you should be concerned, and it's no surprise for Shiva that you see a what? All the serpents around his head, not to mention the beads and everything, just like you see with prayer and rosary beads, and both Buddhism and Catholicism is that a surprise or a coincidence either not to mention how all of them have a sun halo symbol all around them just like the images of the false white image of the messiah jesus christ in the false name by the way why do you think they all have the sun symbolism around them and they're all holding up these different hand gestures and by the way shiva's holding up a trident well, it's just very interesting and suspicious indeed because if you were to flip the two ends of the spears of this trident and if you were to flip them to be horizontal this way, it looked like he was holding a cross just like the Buddha swastika that is exactly shaped like a cross. Oh my goodness, very interesting. Is that a coincidence either?
And then, of course, we also have the Greek Trinity as well. We have Athena, Apollo, and none other than Zeus himself. That is exactly where you find that too. Oh, but that's not the only place you find trinities. Don't worry, it's not just the Greek, Egyptian, or Hindu culture that you see trinities. It's also in other cultures too that were worshipped by Vikings just as well. Because above you see a picture of Zeus, Tertatus, and Tyrannus right here. And notice what? It looks to be another halo sun symbol around and wow, they hold up the same exact hand gesture as Jesus Christ do, and another figure as well. Is that a coincidence? I'm not making this stuff up. You all need to seriously see what's right in front of you. And there's the Norwegian Trinity as well in the 14th century too. And of course we have what? Horus and the Egyptian Trinity. And is it a surprise or coincidence that the IHS symbolism can also spell out Isis, Horus, and Seb? I do not think so. That is exactly what it's talking about. And of course we have Krishna too that is also represented too with Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in these trinities respectively in the Hindu incarnations as well. But is that all? No, because it seems as though every single culture and every single region has had trinities or had some type of trinities even long before there was the Messiah on earth. Because here we have the Egyptian trinity of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, of course. And here's the Babylonian trinity of who? Semiramis, Tammuz, and Nimrod himself. And then we have Palmyra as well, a triune there. We also have it with India, as we talked about, with Brahma, Shiva, and uh, Vishnu too. And then we also have it in other places, in Buddhist places. We also see it in Norway as well. We also see it in France too. We also see trinities embedded in Germany with the Vikings and Italy as well. I'm telling you, it's all over the place. It's worldwide. And these trinities came long before and long after the Messiah. And like I said, nowhere in scripture does it even say the word trinity. So we know it is of pagan descent and of pagan origin. Well, what about the whole mother child and worshiping mother child? Where does that come from? I'll tell you where it comes from. It goes all the way back and traces all the way back to Babylonian religion. That is where all of that comes from. That is where it all started with Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz. It's the exact same thing. And such a concept spread from nation to nation, from culture to culture, and that is why you see the Trinity everywhere. But that's not the only thing that spread from culture to culture and nation to nation, because what also spread is what? The idea of mother and child, and the idea of worshiping mother and child, and the idea of Mary and Jesus. Well, is Mary and Jesus anything new? Because I'm showing you statues of the Black Madonna. And rem remember, it all stems from an origin from the Roman Catholic Church, the same beast system in the church that took out the second commandment in order to justify such abominable pagan worshiping and statues and graven images when it goes against the commandments of our father Yahuwah. And he does not appreciate that. But do you see this in just the Christian culture? Or was it already embedded in these cultures and religions in different places thousands of years before there even was Christianity? Here I'm showing you a picture of a statue of the Black Madonna, as you can see the mother with child that is actually seen in a museum. Now the reason I'm showing you this is because this is a statue that is seen primarily in Europe and other different places. But if you look closely towards the bottom, you also see pine cones. And if you watch my video, The Truth About the Third Eye, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about and exactly what those pine cones are referencing. More abominations indeed. Because what you will find is that we see the same mother and child all over the place and we see that it was embedded in other cultures and other religions and other nations thousands and thousands of years ago and what you're looking at right now is a picture of who Semiramis and Tammuz that is exactly what you're looking at their statue and when you look at Semiramis wow she kind of reminds you and is very reminiscent of the Statue of Liberty holding what appears to be a torch interesting and look at the hand gesture that Tammuz is making wow doesn't Jesus Christ make that exact same hand gesture or am I just just seeing things.
Oh no, it's definitely a coincidence because I'm showing you who another Egyptian mother and child statue of who? Isis and Horus. And that is where you get that from, who looks very similar and very reminiscent of who? Mary and Jesus. Now, yes, the real Messiah, Yahusha, he did in fact have a mother, but nowhere did they tell us to go and make statues of them and go paint them white and go make abominable images of them to in order to worship them. Nowhere does he tell us to do that that in scripture. Nowhere does the Messiah teach on that, but rather he teaches the law, statutes, and commandments, which we're going to be going over later on. And as you can see, there's a halo around them too. I wonder why that's always the case. But we don't just see the mother and child reference embedded in Egyptian and in Babylonian cultures. Oh no, because we also see it in the Indian culture as well with Devaki and Krishna too. And this is one image showing it and depicting it. And it looks like Krishna has what? A sun halo around him in this picture. But we also see it here with who? Devaki and Krishna. I'm not making this stuff up. It's time that you see what's right in front of you. And it, it's very reminiscent of who? Mary and Jesus, the Queen Mother of Heaven. That is where that comes from. That is where that originates from. Scripture even talks about the Queen Mother of Heaven and how abominable it is in the book of Yarm Yahu or Jeremiah. But these aren't the only places that you see it. We also see it embedded in the Buddhist culture as well, because this is a picture depicting who Buddha and his mother Maya. And that's exactly what you see. And look what's around young Buddha here, a sun symbol as well. No different. Nothing new is under the sun, not to mention the M.A. that we're always seeing that are often associated with the names of these mothers. For example, we see Maya and Buddha, Mary and Jesus. And when you look at the word mother in the Hindi, you get the word man for Krishna. Very interesting and suspicious indeed, but I bet you still think it's all a coincidence. I'm sorry to tell you this, but it is not, because I'm here showing you a Chinese depiction of Hu Xing Mu, the queen mother in China. And this is a representation of the mother and child that is also seen and embedded in Chinese culture and ancient Chinese cultures as well. As you can see, Xing Mu, who is often known as the queen mother in China. And notice the sun symbols around them too, as well, around the mother and child. Oh, but it's all a coincidence. Here's a statue depicting the queen mother in China. As you can see, this statue depicts Xing Mu right here, and there's the child right there. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. And this is mostly seen in China as well. So we also see it in Chinese culture, Buddhist culture, Asian culture, Hindu culture, as well as Egyptian culture and Babylonian culture. Nothing new is under the sun indeed. And even according to Johns Hopkins University, the etymology of the word religion, because yes, Islam, like Christianity and all the other religions, they are religions. That word etymology comes from religio, which means what? To bind, to bind again, because of the re, religion means to bind again. And that's why I'm doing this video, so you can break out of the bondage of religion and be deceived no more. Because just as our true Messiah Yahusha says, the truth will make you free. Now a predominant symbol that you see in Islam is known as the hand of Fatima, also known as Khamsa, which means number five in Arabic. Now in Islamic tradition, the hand represents the five pillars of Islam, which are Shahada, which is faith, Salat, which is prayer, Psalm, which is fasting, Zakah, which is almsgiving, and also Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. This hand can also represent Muhammad, Fatima, Ali, Hassan, and Hussein, the main five that make up the Muhammad family but is mostly attributed to the daughter of Muhammad known as Fatima and is supposed to be a symbol of luck and fortune and also wealth. But who is the deity of fortune and where does all of this come from? The father of all lies, G-O-D, Satan, or name for Satan, because that's exactly what it means in the Hebrew fortune, a Babylonian deity of fortune that represents Satan. This can also be known as the eye of Fatima too because you see the giant one eye right in the middle of the palm of the hand. Who does that remind you of? 
eye of Horus, the eye of Ra, mystery, Egyptian, Babylonian religion all over again, just like in the dollar bill on top of the pyramid, the capping of the new world order. That's what that represents. It stems from Egyptian religion. Now, the Khamsa is not only seen in Islam, but it's also seen in other religions such as Christianity and even Judaism too, and it predates all of these religions by at least thousands of years. And it has been theorized also that its origins lie in ancient Egypt or even Carthage, and it's been associated with another deity also. So you see, it's nothing new under the sun. You even see a similar hand right here that's commonly attributed to Miriam, the sister of Moses, right here in Judaism. And you even see right here the pentagram, which represents what? The satanic star, the satanic pentagram. This has to do with who? The star of Molech. And in early Christianity, this hand symbol was used to and attributed to Mary. This is nothing new. This has nothing to do with Fatima whatsoever, but this is a satanic symbol and satanic worship. And once again, this is nothing new. You see this attributed all over different religions. You see the one-eyed symbolism even right here in Asian religions. You see it right here, and you even see it again with the same hand symbol and Jewish traditions. Now when it comes to Hinduism and Buddhism, the hand represents chakras. And what this really is doing is that it's portals and invitations to demons and demonic evil spirits. That's what you're doing when you have these hand of Fatimas all over, plastered all over the place as jewelry and wall hangings. You're allowing demons and evil spirits in and any type of variations of this hand, regardless of the religion, even in Hinduism and Buddhism. It's believed by some that this hand is supposed to provide defense against the evil eye, but is that really what it's doing? Where does all of this stem from? Once again, all roads lead to Rome because where does the idea of the Hamza come from? It comes from Rome because here's the Manopantia, which was used in Rome hundreds of years before the hand of Fatima and all the other ones. It says in Rome, this little hand is well known and is called by everybody the Manopantia. The use of hand gestures giving blessing is an ancient motive in art. This particular gesture of the fingers is known as the Manopantia, which predates Christianity and can be seen in pagan motives to ward off the evil eye and ancient Egyptian artifacts invoking parental protection. But notice how you have a similarity between all these different religions and all of the hand gestures that these religions have because they're showing you that they're all the exact same thing. It's the worship of Satan. All of these hand gestures, including the hand of Fatima and the all-seeing eye, which is where that eye stems from and gets its pagan roots from, it's all pagan in origin. Notice how these idols hold up the exact same hand gestures representing idolatry because this is showing you Mary holding up that same hand gesture and I've gone over this and talked about it in previous videos, plenty of videos with the two fingers up and the two fingers down just as we saw with ancient Rome. Buddha holds up a similar hand gesture right here with the two fingers up right there and also the 666 and even though the 666 right here I'm telling you where does it all come from? There's Krishna who's also holding up the hand gesture too similar to the Kamsa and another hand gesture right there and the list goes on and on when it comes to Hinduism and Buddhism specifically. But that same satanic hand gesture, the one we just went over, the one that's used for the same purposes to ward off the evil eye that was used in ancient Rome, well, guess who else holds it up too? J.C. You see the two fingers up and the two fingers down, also held by the popes themselves too. Have you ever wondered where that hand gesture comes from? Have you ever wondered why they hold up that hand gesture? Because they're giving homage to who? The satanic Baphomet, who also holds up the exact same hand gesture gesture as above so below is the motto and that's where it comes from and that's who you're giving homage to when you have the hand of Fatima because it comes and stems from the exact same thing.
Now there are claims made that are said that the hand of Fatima is to ward off the evil eye. But do you see how Satan plays both sides? Do you see how Satan plays both the good and the evil? Because both are evil, both are just as bad. And what both do is that they give invitation for demons. Any type of use of amulets or charms such as the Kamza, the Hand of Fatima, allows in demons. You're allowing and opening up doorways for demons and evil demonic spirits to come into your house or shop or wherever you have these jewelries and these hangings and these carvings. Also, no graven images just like what was given to Musa or Moses from the creator Yahuwah himself. No graven images. That includes the Hand of Fatima. All of these Nazars and all of these amulets and things, they are forms of graven images and also are forms of demonic worship. And as I have just shown you, it stems from Rome. The usage of the Kamza can also be traced all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Mesopotamian religion, which came thousands and thousands of years ago. And as you can see right here, it's also a universal sign of who? The deity Ishtar and Inanna, just like with Easter. So when Christians celebrate Easter, they're actually celebrating Ishtar Semiramis. That's who the Virgin Mary represents. That's who Fatima represents. They're the exact same thing. It's no different. And as I'm showing you and proving to you, all of these religions go hand in hand. They're very similar. That's why it's time to come out of the bondage known as religion, Islam included. That's why our creator says we are not to have any type of witchcraft or sorcery or any type of charms and spells because it's a form of witchcraft and it allows demons in. Be deceived no more. And prayerfully, you also understand, too, that these charms and amulets, they do not ward off the evil eye, but rather they actually give more power to it. It is a grand delusion, and that is what the enemy has done, has made evil look good and good evil, not anymore. Because these are spiritual portals that allow demons in, but no longer will you be deceived anymore. But it's even true with prayer beads, also more graven images. And you see this all over embedded in how many religions, but where does it come from? All roads lead to Rome. And you even see it in Islam known as Misbaha. In Turkey, the beads are known as Tespi and they're used for prayer. Now the Misbaha normally consists of 99 beads to assist in prayers. But notice all of this ritual that takes place with it. Note the ritual that's very similar to the rosary beads and praying the rosary. Also, now it's just the same difference in Islam too. It's the exact same thing. And they say that the 99 beads also refer to the 99 names of Allah. Well, that's interesting how it's 99 names. Because last I checked, according to scripture and according to our father himself that was given to Masha, Musa, Moses, according to the law, our creator has one name and one name alone. Somebody is lying to you. And once again, this is no different than Christianity. It's no different than Roman Catholicism. And note the two hand gestures right there, the demonic hand gesture. It's the same thing as the prayer rope along with the rosary and the rosary beads, which is used for Roman Catholic Church, it's the same thing. Do you see the similarities between Roman Catholicism and Islam and where Islam gets the misbaha from? They get it from the rosary, they get it from the Roman Catholic Church. And notice how with the rosary beads, they use it in the Catholic Church for counting the component prayers and also a homage to Mary. It's the same thing. Do you see the similarities here? All of this is based on tradition. All of this is based on religion and reciting in different prayers. But who are you actually really praying to? Then there's also the Dikar, which is the name of the devotional acts in Islam, in which short phrases or prayers are repeatedly recited silently within the mind or aloud. But this is comparable to the rosary beads of Catholicism and the Japa Mala of Hindu tradition. Do you see how all of these religions are the same exact thing? The same beads, the same reciting of prayers, 
And then you also have the Japa Mala, or commonly known as Mala in the Sanskrit, which means garland. And this is a string of prayer beads that's commonly used by Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and some Sikhs for spiritual practice known as Sanskrit as Japa. It is usually made from 108 beads, though other numbers are also used. Malas are also used for keeping count while reciting, chanting, or mentally repeating a mantra or the name or names of a deity. Huh? That sounds just like what the misbaha in Islam very interesting and suspicious indeed they're the exact same thing and this has nothing to do with our creator whatsoever this has nothing to do with righteousness whatsoever but it's pagan and giving homage to demons to Satan as you can see right here and note how it's in all these religions embedded in Islam Catholicism Buddhism Hinduism and even in Wiccan traditions also and Sikhism and Jainism it's no different it's time to come out of these religions because all of this is graven images and it's no wonder the beast known as the Roman Catholic Church had to take that commandment out and replace it adding and taking away why because they know and because they're trying to justify pagan satanic worship and blending and merging all these religions together and the similarities between all of them do you see this with both your eyes open now but now we're going to go over what the mark of the beast really is and how it relates to Islam and like we said earlier ago, all roads lead to Rome because now we're here in Kazun, the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 1, where it says, And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads names of blasphemy. The beast identified in Revelation 13, the beast of the sea, is the Roman Catholic Church note how the Pope wears a Mitra hat from Babylon fish worship of the sea you see there's something fishy about this indeed do you see the similarities how the Pope is wearing the Mitra hat which is the same thing that was worn in Babylon and Assyria nothing new under the Sun it's the exact same thing ancient fish worship because it's the beast of the sea where all of these different religions come from this is who they pay homage to and as you have just learned in this video this is the same entity and organization that's behind all of these religions and pushing them islam included how does the beast relate to islam well i'm going to show you because now we're in kazun revelation chapter 13 verse 18 where it says here is the discernment he who has understanding let him calculate the number of the beast and his number is 666 now i've covered this in detail from my mark of the beast video but in a brief summary it's these three greek symbols right here that yaukanon or as you know him as yaya the apostle actually saw these three right here and as you can see this is the text and how it looks in the ancient greek text of the 666 that's talked about in revelation chapter 13 right here huh this looks very similar doesn't it now what is the mark of the beast here is the discernment because it's multiple things it's not just one thing but if you looked at my video mark of the beast then you would see and i've shown too in that video covering what the real mark truly is which is what religion anything that's based on the roman catholic church in that video we also cover too the mark and image of the beast which is what the cross is the mark of the beast crossing out salvation and by the way the real true messiah Yahusha was not nailed to a cross he was hung on a tree and there are plenty of scriptures to even prove his being hung on a tree who were the only group of people you know in history who have been hung on trees especially when it says cursed is everyone who hangeth on a tree and that the messiah was made a curse for us and as you will see in a minute to come the cross has to do with what crossing out salvation from your heart crossing out the truth that's what it has to do because that is the lawless one JC the lawless one and if you have not already taken a look please take a look at my video the pagan origins of JC so you can learn more and so that you can be deceived no more 
Now those same Greek letters that we just went over is also apparent and seen right here in images of JC, the image of the false messiah by the way. You even see it right here, there it is once again, these same letters that are very reminiscent to the Greek letters that we just saw and I talk and cover more of this in the Mark of the Beast video. Again, this hand gesture, where else have we seen that demonic satanic hand gesture before? That's why it says they receive a mark on their foreheads, just like with Ash Wednesday, a mark on the forehead, crossing out salvation. The cross is pagan and symbolizes the worship of Tammuz, the worship of ancient Babylon. That's what it is, and this represents what? The crossing out of salvation because the Messiah was, in fact, hung on a tree. And it's also no surprise either how you even see the cross embedded in other religions and other ancient religions such as the Egyptian cross and even in Egyptian religions known as the Ankh also see how nothing new is under the sun. They had crosses back then and they have them even to this day. And I've done a video covering the pagan origins of the cross also even showing you and proving to you that they even have crosses in ancient Egyptian religion also use thousands and thousands of years ago, even before the Messiah walked the earth in the flesh. And it's the exact same thing, the exact same type of worship. And note the swastika cross here too, because where else do you see that in another religion? Buddha has it too. You see it right here. There's the cross. It's the swastika. It's no different from the Christian cross right there. And what is Buddha holding up? Like something similar to the Kamsa? Very interesting and suspicious indeed. I'm telling you, it's all the same thing. It's time to wake up out of these religions and deceptions. You see this dot right here? What does that represent? The third eye, the evil eye. It's time to wake up out of these deceptions quick because it pays homage to the dead and is the worship of Tammuz and has nothing to do with our true Messiah, Yahusha. And it's no surprise or coincidence either how crosses are attributed to the dead and the worship of the dead. That's why you even see them at cemeteries. But last I checked in the scripture, our creator is the all of the living and not the dead also the beast of the earth in Revelation 13 is talking about who? The earth pig known as Jesus. And like I said, you can watch my video on the pagan origins of Jesus Christ to learn more about that. But even as the book of Revelation chapter 13 says too, that the beast causes all to receive a mark upon their right hand or upon their foreheads. You see the mark of the beast on the forehead? Where else do you see this? But it gets even deeper than that because what does this actually look like? What does this title right here in the Arabic, what does this look like and who is this reminiscent of? That's right, it's reminiscent of the serpent, and that's who that is. Allah is the serpent, it's Satan himself, that's who it is. And you need to see this with both your eyes open because the truth is finally being revealed and restored unto you even as we speak. And who does the serpent represent? The serpent represents the dragon. And it's interesting because the book of Revelation also talks about the dragon. Where it even says here in Revelation 13 verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. The beast is Rome and the dragon is who? Okay, and then it says, And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Is this what the Muslims are saying when it comes to the Quran? Because notice the sign right here. We have a king who can make war with him. Does this sound familiar to you? 
And notice also in the Arabic too, how this symbol looks like what? A dragon, it looks like a serpent, just like we went over. Well, who is the great serpent? Revelation 12, 9 says that the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And that is exactly who you are worshiping and who you are paying homage to when you call on Allah, when you call on that title, and when you go to these mosques and worship to Allah, you are calling on Satan, you are calling on the devil, you are taking the mark of the beast in your forehead, which is also your mind. Because when you attach Akbar to the title, you get great. Well, who is great according to Revelation 12, 9? The great dragon, the great serpent. And yes, it even says that Satan has deceived the entire world. And yes, that includes Islam. Yes, that includes Christianity. Because I've also covered Christianity and the pagan origins of Jesus Christ in another video, which is linked in the description box also. But it's same is true also for Islam. Be deceived no more. It's time to break out of these chains of deception and bondage known as religion, Islam included, and see the truth. Because the truth is what makes you free but what about the moon symbol that you see all over the place especially embedded in flags all over the arab world could that be ancient pagan moon worship oh of course it is because who was the moon deity at the time who Baal was worshiped at the kaaba and if you actually look at hinduism this is the same as who it's the same as shiva who is the Indian idol of destruction representing Satan also, representing demons. The crescent moon was the symbol. Muhammad's pagan grandfather, Abad al-Mutalib, almost slaughtered Muhammad's dad, Abdallah, at the Kaaba to who this moon idol, and this is according to Ibn Hisham right here. More pagan symbols, just like with the cross for Christianity and the star of David for Judaism. And by the way, that star has nothing to do with David, but has everything to do with Molech. The crescent moon is a universal symbol for Islam is a pagan symbol, more idolatry, idol worship, graven images. Just like the words from Shaluma, or as you know as Solomon, nothing new is under the sun. Because yes, Allah is a moon deity. It's the worship of Satan the worship of the serpent, the worship of the beast. And as you can see right here, a symbol from Ur, ancient Mesopotamia from the 2000s BCE. What do you see? The moon and the crescent symbol right there and the star symbol. The moon deity rode on a winged bull and his symbols were the crescent and tripod. Just like today in Islam, nothing new under the sun. Wow, 4,000 years later and nothing has changed. And as we went over earlier in the picture from the prophet Comet, you see it once again with Allah what is an idol, a moon idol, a photo showing you Allah sitting on the throne with the crescent moon on the chest right here because it's a moon deity. See the moon right there and the star up here just like before, nothing new under the sun. And this is archaeologically proven. This is an archaeological fact. Because all Islam is, is that it's the revival of the ancient moon deity worship, just like Christianity is sun worship by going to church on Sunday. You see how that is? And also the word Monday, meaning moon day. 
And by the way, Hubal, who is the chief idol of Mecca, is also linked to Baal, also known as Hu Tammuz, the same one where you get Babylon and Semiramis from, who is what? The son of Nimrod and the son of Semiramis. And that's also where you get the cross from too. See how it's all linked to Babylonian worship? Come out of her, come out of Babylon, come out of Islam, come out of Christianity, and come out of all these other religions religions, period. And here's more archaeological evidence. You see the moon right there with the crescent star up here, even in Babylonian tradition and archaeology, Baal worship is what this is. Here is more archaeological evidence from Sumerian, which is what Babylon and represents Baal worship with the crescent moon and the star used thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago before Islam was even thought of. Nothing new under the sun. And it's time you know who you are worshiping and who you are paying homage to and to be deceived no more. Because you also see the name of Satan in Yashayahu or Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 where it says and uses the phrase son of the morning. Well, when you actually look at that in the Hebrew or the Yahudith, you get Hillel ban Sha'ar, which means what? Crescent moon and Sha'ar means morning star, as you can see right here. So who does that represent? It represents Lucifer. It represents Satan. And also Muslims mark their food with the crescent mark, which they call Halal, which is clearly a variation of the very name of who? Lucifer Hillel is what that represents. And notice how Halal is A-L-L-A-H, unscrambled, representing Lucifer. Lucifer, Satan, as we've just proven. That's why you see the crescent moon and the star all over Islam. You see it in Islamic flags. You see it on the top of mosques. You see it all over the place. And who does it give homage to? It represents Hillel ban Sha'ar, the son of the morning, the crescent moon. That's talking about Lucifer, Satan. It gives homage and worship to Satan. You even see it on the flag of Malaysia and other countries. It's time to wake up and see the truth that's right in front of you. And see, our creator's name is Yahua, and his son's name is Yahusha. Before you think about going on another Hajj or a pilgrimage to Mecca, you need to see this and how closely related the Kaaba is to what? The Tefillin cube and how they share remarkable similarities. And this cube can be found where? In ancient Judaism. Because this once a year ritual of circling around the black stone, and we know that the black stone represents what? Wood and stone graven images and has nothing to do with Abraham whatsoever but the worship of pagan moon idols. What this is, is giving worship to who? Saturn. Saturn worship. Saturn or Satan. And that's why the cube worship in the Kaaba and Mecca represents what? Saturn and its color, Balak, who represents Saturn, who represents Satan, who is Molech, Molech worship, which is also represented in the scriptures, nothing new under the sun. And what does this look like up close? It looks like the rings of Saturn going around. It looks like the rings of Saturn of Satan. So every time you partake in the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca, you're giving more power to the beast known as Satan the serpent. Every time you pray to A-L-L-A-H or even say in the name of A-L-L-A-H, you're giving homage to the beast. And the same goes for L-O-R-D. The same goes for G-O-D because that's the shortened name of Satan. Satan. Language is so important. And when you know who you're worshiping, then you see the truth that's right in front of you. But it's not just Islam that you see the black cube on the Kaaba because you also see it in places such as Santa Ana, Manhattan, Australia, and even Denmark. And of course with the tefillin which the Jewish wear on their heads. And by the way, this has nothing to do with scripture whatsoever. But this has to do with what ancient Saturn Satan worship because yes, Judaism is Satanism in disguise. 
And it's no wonder then because the word Kabbalah sounds like what? Kabbalah, which is ancient Jewish mysticism, ancient Jewish religion, which is what the Tefillin cube represents. That's what this cube represents. And to the ancient Egyptians, Ka is spirit and Ba is the soul. And you see it's the blending and merging of all these different religions together, just like the Pope is trying to do. You even see it right here with the hexagram. And notice how you get a cube from the cross also. So when you wear a cross, if you're Christian, it's no different than giving worship to the cube, to the beast, to Satan. It's time to come out of these paganisms and see where they truly originate from. Because the black cube was also founded and worshipped also in ancient Egyptian religion too and represents the pagan Egyptian deity of evil, darkness, chaos, war, and conflict. And that's who you're giving homage to if you're worshipping and partaking in the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. And also to the moon idols because it's giving homage to who? To Baal, to Satan. Do you see it with both your eyes open? And once again, the cube also represents what? The hexagram, which is the same satanic six-pointed star that has nothing to do with David whatsoever, but is what? The star of Molech, the star of Saturn, Satan worship, also representing and having to do with CERN and opening up portals and doorways. And anytime you do this satanic worship around this rock and stone, what you're doing is you're allowing demons and opening up doorways four demons and even with the Jewish with the Tefillin cube in Judaism. See how they're no different? See how all of these religions are the exact same thing? Just like with the Christian cross that's also a cube and can be formed into a cube? See how they're all the same? And more reason to get out of religion and stop believing the lies of the Quran and stop believing the lies of Satan who is A-L-L-A-H because what does our creator Yahuwah tell Musa or Masha Moses in Leviticus chapter 26 verse 1 in the Torah also known as the Torah. Neither shall you place any figured stone in your land to bow down unto it. That's why the second command is no graven images, but you see graven images even with the Kabbah, the stone, and we're also going to be talking about the black stone and how that represents phallic worship, but also with these beads as we've gone over embedded in all these other different religions as we see with Buddhism, Islam, Baha'i, and even Catholicism, and also with Hinduism. The cross and all of these pagan titles such as L-O-R-D, G-O-D, and A-L-L-A-H, which all give homage and worship to Satan as we've just proven in this video. But what about the black stone? Because that also relates and ties to pagan origin and also phallic worship. And you're going to see the phallic worship and hidden phallic symbols in Islamic architecture and also in mosques. But now we're going to be starting with the black stone. And if you're watching this and if you're Hindu, it's time to come out of that too because Shiva is the stone inside of Shakti's vagina. And you see in Islam, Shiva is inside of the Shakti and in Hindu, the Shiva Yoni right here, which is what? The Shiva Ling, Shakti's vagina. It represents the vagina of more phallic worship, more disgusting phallic symbols that you're paying homage to and worshiping in your respective religions. And this has to do with lingam, which is what? More proof of the mark of the beast. Because notice how lingam in Sanskrit literally means what? Sign, symbol, or mark. Just like what? The mark of the beast? Just like we expose for Christianity and the cross? And even as we expose to with Islam having to do with the word A-L-L-A-H embedded on the foreheads of minds of people and also on headbands and wristbands, now we even see it in Hinduism also. Do you see the similarities along with the Buddha swastika, which is also across too? I'm telling you, it all relates to the beasts come out of these religions. But this lets you know that the Linga or the Shiva Linga is an abstract or anaconic representation 
representation of who? The Hindu deity Shiva, which also is represented and worshipped for Allah. Also, it's the same thing with the worship of Satan, and it's used for worship in temples, shrines, or as self-manifested natural objects as we even see with the black stones. The Linga is also seen as a symbol of energy and potential of who? The devil himself. And you even see it with the black stone. How disgusting indeed. And you even see a picture of it right there. What are they worshiping? They're worshiping the penis. It's phallic symbols and it's very disgusting indeed because you even see it right there. But there's even been debates about it. You can even see it right here. A lingam with what? A swastika, the cross, the mark of the beast I see at one of the temples in Pakistan I see. Do you see how all of this relates? And by the way, while scholars try to pass this off, they know darn well that pillar worship is a form of, in fact, phallic worship. That's what it represents. You can see it right there, how it looks like a vagina, a penis inside of a vagina. They try to justify because they're trying to lie because Satan is the father of all lies. But now you see the truth with your eyes wide open. Here is another one. What does this look like? What is this very reminiscent of? And like I said, you see it even on the black stone with the Kaaba. You even see it in Hinduism and Buddhism also. What is that telling you? It's telling you that it's time to come out of these religions, come out of Babylon, come out of Islam, and come out of these mosques. Why? Because if you take a look at them, you'll see that these mosques, in them, there is hidden phallic worship and phallic symbols that's hidden even in Islamic architecture, like right here. What does that look like? Even with the phallic mosques right there, you see that this is a phallic symbol, just like with church steeples, and I've gone over this even in my Christian video exposing Christianity and religion with the church steeples for Sunday sun worship. The steeple represents what? The phallic symbol of Nimrod. It's the symbol of the penis just like the Christmas tree. You even see it right there in Islamic architecture. You see it right here too. What does that look like? Semen. You see it right there again in Islamic architecture and even right here too that looks like the lingam right there, a penis inside of a vagina. More ancient and archaeological proof and evidence even shown right here and how this is nothing new, how this was used even thousands of years ago because here's the Shiva Linga, again, the penis inside of the vagina right there. Number two shows the Shivta ruins of Israel. You can see the phallic symbol right there. Right here also, that's how it was made in architect and design. And then right here, number three is Petra Jordan. You see it right there too. You see the penis right here at Al Hijar in Saudi Arabia and also the mosque dome because what these pillars represent and the pillars of Islam just like with the church steeples they represent the phallic symbol penis worship of who of Nimrod because the ancient story goes in Babylonian tradition that Semiramis the wife of Nimrod who also represents Mary and Fatima what did she do? She gathered up all the pieces of Nimrod after he was killed. Only one piece she did not gather up, which was to be memorialized, and that piece was, of course, the phallic symbol, the penis, which is to be memorialized, and it's memorialized with things such as Christmas, and as you even see right here, even in all these different religions, Islam included. All goes back to Babylon because that's who it represents. It represents the phallic symbol and the Shiva Lingam represents what? The vagina of Semiramis also, the mother and wife of who? Nimrod Baal who represents who? JC and also represents Allah. She was called Ishtar, also pronounced Easter in English and we've gone over that and how abominable it is even in our pagan origins of JC video and have done a separate video on it and why we are not to celebrate that Hela day and how it has nothing to do with the true Messiah Yahusha whatsoever and also Ashtaroth and Isis now Mary see nothing new is under the sun and as we also talked about it's also Fatima in Islam also nothing new under the sun all these thousands of years later and it's even plastered on Starbucks too and we've covered a video on that also do you see how all of what thousands and thousands of years later even in a Egyptian religion is nothing new and here it is once again alive and well mystery Babylonian religion exposed.
even if you just Google search and take a Google search of some of the pictures of these Hindu temples and the phallic symbolism and you'll see them embedded everywhere. What does it look like? Very disgusting indeed. Who are you really giving homage to? Are you giving homage to the creator of the universe because there's only one creator or are you giving homage to something totally, completely different? The same is true with Buddhist temples also because you see the same type of phallic symbols with those including structures on Vihara, stupas, wats, or pagodas in different regions and languages. And you'll see that they claim to have been designed to symbolize five elements, fire, air, earth, water, and wisdom. You'll see right here for a stupa, for example, do you see the phallic symbolism right there? Just like in Islam, just like with the Christian church, it's no different, just like with with Hinduism, with the lingam, it's the same thing, giving homage to the same devil. Again, who are you worshiping? Who are you giving homage to? Who are you paying homage to when you offer up certain things to these idols and these deities? Who are you paying homage to when you offer up food and drinks to these statues who cannot talk, they cannot think, they cannot breathe, they cannot smell? What exactly are you doing? This is very important indeed. Because in Hindu deity, the concept varies from a personal deity to 33 Vedic deities, which I find interesting because 33 is a number prevalent in Freemasonry to hundreds in Hinduism, if not thousands, that are worshipped. And what you'll also notice, not only with the hand gestures and the halos, but with some of the tridents that they wear, they look and appear to be like crosses too. As we've also noticed, crossing out salvation, you see the halo behind right here one of the ones that's very interesting and suspicious indeed is this one Devi which is of course the Sanskrit word for a female deity but isn't it interesting how it's one letter short of what the word devil just add an L to it and you get the word devil is that who you're paying homage to these words are very similar to who? To Ishtar. Paganism is where all of this stems from. You see what you are doing. All of these are deities. All of these are idols. And Murtis is what? An image, statue, or idol of a deity or person in Indian culture. What are you really worshiping? These deities and idols, they cannot move. They cannot think. What are you actually doing when you're offering up to them and paying homage and paying worship to them when they did not create you, nor did they create the universe? And your text might claim that they have, but really they have not because they're based on oral traditions that have been passed down for thousands of years and you have been lied to for thousands of years not anymore because remember this the real truth will make you free and remember this also murti is typically made by carving stone woodworking metal casting or through pottery but the creator of the universe does not require that at all and is against the carving of wood and stone and the worship of wood and stone because they cannot move whatsoever. This is a form of idolatry. And all of these rituals and everything, these are embedded in Freemasonry and Islam and other different religions as we've also gone over in this video along with the puja rituals too. Prayer rituals and all of these things that you have to do with these religions. Do you think that it's paying homage to the creator or is it paying homage to something totally different? By the way, you see Krishna playing the flute right here. What is this reminiscent and very similar to? Oh, that's right. The Pied Piper also. Who? Satan in disguise. And when the people follow the Pied Piper, it leads them where? It leads them in a not so great place. Is this also you when it comes to following Krishna and Hinduism and Buddhism and all these other religions?
Because then there's also the topic of spirit houses. And this is a very important topic indeed, because what is a spirit house? In case you don't already know, it is a shrine to the protective spirit of a place that is found in the Southeast Asian countries of Burma, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. It's normally in the form of small roof structure and is mounted on a pillar or on a dais. Not to mention that the shrines often include images or what carved statues of people and animals and that votive offerings are left at the house to propitiate the spirits. More elaborate installations include an altar for this purpose. Do you see the problem here? Because it is a long-standing Thai tradition to leave offerings of food and drink at the spirit house, including rice, bananas, coconuts, and desserts, along with Fanta drinks, too. Depending on where you go in Asia, these things are seen pretty much on every single corner, every single block in Thailand. But don't you understand that all you're doing is inviting demons in if you have these in your restaurant or if you have these in your house or if you have these anywhere near you? You are offering up to idols. This is a form of idolatry because these spirits, the only spirits that are here and enjoying this are demons. You see all of these carved images and carved statues. What are you offering up? Food and drinks to these idols that cannot eat or drink these things whatsoever that was carved by human hands. You see this right here that looks like a serpent right there. What is this really worshiping? Who are you really paying homage to? Because they cannot see or hear you, nor can they see or hear what you're doing, but you're offering up to idols a form of idolatry tree. And this is an invitation of demons, once again, stemming from Rome, ancient Babylonian mystery religion exposed. And like I said, if anything, you're inviting in demons and potentially placing a curse on your house or your restaurant or your shop. If this is near you or if you're the one responsible for this, the best thing to do would be to completely destroy it. Now we'll quickly cover Chinese philosophy when it comes to the yin and the yang with the opposites, how they attract and complement each other. And as their symbol illustrates, each side has its core and element of the other. Now you'll see that what a correct balance between the two poles must be reached in order to achieve harmony. Then it goes over the origins. But pay careful attention because you'll see that yin and yang is also used where? In paganism too. And you see the S right there like the serpent and also the practice of feng shui which is what a pseudoscience originating from china claiming to use energy forces to harmonize individuals with their surrounding environment this also can be used what this can be a form of astrology which we are also to stay away from and you think the tongue sticking out, you might think that that's an innocent gesture, but is it really? Because when you see celebrities sticking out their tongues, who are they giving homage to? To idols, to Kali, a Hindu deity, as you see right here with the tongue sticking out. You see the serpent right there? Oh my goodness, you see the dot right there? What is that really alluding to? And the crescent symbol too? Serpent right there? Are you also worshiping serpents, the worship of animals? Animals, and not the worship of the Creator? Also, pay careful attention and note the similarities when it comes to the number eight, specifically in Buddhism and in Hinduism, because here in Buddhism you have the Dharma wheel or the Dharma chakra, which is a symbol in Buddhism. As you can see, it says the Dharma wheel or the Dharma chakra in Sanskrit is one of the oldest symbols of Buddhism. Around the plane, it's used to represent Buddhism in the same way that a cross represents Christianity or Star of David, Judaism. And we've already gone over and covered those symbols and this one what is no different what is this reminiscent of right here very reminiscent and similar to the golden calf very interesting and suspicious indeed not only that but it's likely that what this symbol evolved out of hinduism 
also see a number eight here too in Hinduism in this right here where it says Ashta Mangala, which is a sacred suite of eight auspicious signs endemic to a number of Indian religions such as Hinduism, Jainism, and even Buddhism as well. And you see that it's the parasol, a pair of golden fish, conch, treasure vase, lotus, infinite knot, again we've gone over that, victory banner, and the wheel too. Now what's also interesting, do you see the number eight attributed to another religion? Because I do, and that's right here in Wiccan, which is this, the wheel of the year. Notice how these are the holidays of what? Eight festivals celebrated by what? Modern paganism. You see how they're the same thing? And then referring back to this, you see how one of them is including the swastika too? It just so happens that when you take a look at the swastika, you'll see it embedded in Jainism and Hinduism as we've gone over before. But you see it in Jain and you see the Hindu swastika too. Again, the cross, crossing out salvation because you see swastikas are typical in Hindu temples and along in Buddhism as we've also gone over. But interesting enough you also see it all over East Asia with swastika like symbols as well when you look at the Jain flag what do you see when it comes to Jainism you see right here a swastika a cross and along with the crescent moon right there or uh, right there too in Jainism along with the Hindu sign too from ancient Indian religions which also has to do with similarities in Hinduism also in the hand symbol right there again are you crossing out salvation with this cross or this swastika here Along with the Tripundra, remember we went over this with the Bendy too, with the three marks, the mark of the beast, which are what? Three horizontal lines on the forehead, usually with the dot made from sacred ash, has spiritual meaning in Shiva tradition within Hinduism. If you have this on your head, have you accepted the mark of the beast without actually even knowing it? Because remember, it's a mark on your forehead. Just like when it comes to the mudra, the seal, mark, or gesture, mark of the beast, which is a symbolic or ritual gesture in what? Hinduism and Buddhism, more ritualistic tradition, spiritual practice of Indian religions. When you hold up these hand gestures, when you partake in yoga or anything else or personal meditations, are you actually unknowingly accepting the mark of the beast? Because here are just some of the mudras right here. And as you can see in all five of them, what do they have in common? What do all of these five have in common? Not only are they the mark, but also what? 666. They all have 666 in common, the mark of the beast. Not only that, but when you do that and when you partake in this, holding up these hand gestures in yoga and in meditation, are you unknowingly inviting in and allowing demons into your home, into your higher call? or your personal temple which is your body along with your heart along with your mind too within these religions including when it comes to Shintoism it's all what nature worship and even animism animal worship because you see the same theme of animals worshiped and revered in these religions even with Hinduism you see serpents and snakes all over the place Again, the question remains, is there a serpent on your forehead just like with Islam? Because you see it embedded all over Buddhism as well. There's Dagon fish worship as we've also gone over the fish worship seen in religion and Catholicism Christianity. In case you did not know, Jesus means earth pig. Yes, indeed, it's pronounced Jesus, and this is from the Latin word Isus, pronounced Isus, which means earth pig. So every time you call on this name for the Messiah, that is what you're calling on an earth pig. You see how all of the commonalities between animals is embedded within these religions because it can also mean swine, hog, pig, boar. That is what this means, a swine. Remember, our creator told us not to eat the pig could he have been referring to this spiritually as well and other animals not to worship other animals period
Could the name Jesus also mean horse and reference horse? Because if you pronounce it Jesus, the Sus, what does that really mean in the Yaudith Hebrew language? Because Sus in the Hebrew means what? Horses right here, as you can see right here. And it can even mean what? Swallow or swift, the type of bird. Wow, all of these different animals. Animal worship, be deceived no more. But when you look at the G word, G-O-D, you'll see that what? Backwards, it's D-O-G, dog. Are you unknowingly worshiping a dog when you call on G-O-D? Or are you unknowingly worshiping Satan with spelling because it's what? Casting spells. Because G-O-D with the same pronunciation in the Yaudith Hebrew tongue, you'll see that what? It's a Babylonian deity of fortune. Do you see this? So every time you call on G-O-D, you're unknowingly calling on a Babylonian deity. That's why names are so important in language. It's so important also because our creator has a name, not a title. And G-O-D is also what? The shortened name for Satan too. And if you're calling on that word, that is what you're unknowingly saying. Not anymore. Be deceived no more. The truth is what will make you free. And the truth is being revealed to you today. Now you've probably seen these cats speaking of fortune and speaking of animal worship. Well, you probably have seen these figures in Japanese places and also in Chinese places such as nail salons and nail shops and etc and you might think that they're really cute and you might think that they're really innocent oh but they are in fact not because this is called the maneki neko which is a japanese figurine which means the beckoning cat and it's known as a lucky charm or a talisman. Wow, no different than the Nazir, which is often believed to bring good luck to the owner. What? This is a graven image is what this is. So if you have this in your shop or restaurant or business or wherever this is, what you are actually doing is what you are actually cursing your area of where this is. And you are paying homage to the deity of fortune to G-O-D. That is what you are doing. You are secretly worshiping Satan in disguise with this because it is what? It is a talisman, a lucky charm, a charm spell. That is what this is. Luck, fortune, deity of fortune. Just like when Christians call on G-O-D. That word is what? The deity of fortune just like this. It is an idol. It is a figurine. It is pagan and it is abominable and also must be gotten rid of from your house or shop or wherever you are along with any other idols and carvings and statues. More animal worship is here too when it comes to the elephant in Indian religions when it comes to Ganesha right here, also known as Ganapati and a few other names, which is one of the most worshipped deities in the Hindu pantheon. The image is found throughout India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Bali, which is Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Hindu denominations worship regardless of affiliations, and it's also extended to Jains and Buddhists as well because it has an elephant head and it's known to be the deity of new beginnings, success and discernment and the removal of obstacles. But is this really what's going on if you pay homage and worship this or if you have a carved image of it in your possession? animal worship and not only is it animal worship you're giving homage and worship to demons and you may not even be knowing it when you worship to this deity because you see right here the hamza right there the hand gesture right here you see right here the trident which looks like what the title a l l a h as we also went over on the forehead the mark of the beast and also with prayer beads and etc you see all of this how also is Ganesha the elephant deity in Hinduism? How is it also depicted? It's also depicted as behemoth. Yes, behemoth is a demon. Behemoth is a demon. So every time you're worshiping Ganesha or every time you give homage to that elephant deity, you're secretly giving homage to demons and you might not even know it. Now is the time to come out, out of all these religions, come out of Hinduism, come out of Buddhism, come out of Jainism, come out of Sikhism, 
Sikhism, come out of all of these religions because you're giving homage to demons and not to the creator of the universe. And even worse, if you're going to these Hindu temples and offering your hair to these idols or offering certain things to these demons, that's what you're doing. They're being offered up to idols, offered up to demons. And while we're on the topic and the subject of animals, let's not forget about who the goat, also known as the Baphomet. Because you see the Baphomet, the goat right here? You see Shiva over there depicted in Hinduism? Do you see a lot in common? Because I see right here, what does that look like? These right here, what? The trident, very similar. Oh, you see the serpents right there? You see the serpents over here? What are you really truly worshiping serpent worship just like even in Chinese culture with the dragon serpents and even with the goat here what does this look like kundalini is that what you're invoking every time you do meditations and every time you decide to sit down and do these meditations whether it be in Buddhism Hinduism Taoism Jainism or Sikhism what are you actually invoking where is your worship going to when you decide to do all these mudras and hand motions and stuff who are you actually giving legions to who are you bowing down to and you might not even know it offering up incense who are you actually worshiping and also you see right here the shiva lingam right there oh it has a flower but what it is what a penis inside of a vagina wow just like right here because the baphomet is transgender i know this is disgusting but i'm telling you you need to understand exactly who you are worshiping see once again the serpents right there serpents over here you see over here the sun and the moon right there the crescent moon wow there's the crescent moon with baphomet goat worship is what it is and now it's the time to come out of that oh and again it's not just with hinduism with shiva either you see these three lines right there the mark right there mark of the beast right here you see it even right here with this five-pointed pentagram mark on the head do you have the mark of the beast and unknowingly worship satan when you call on god or when you call on k-r-i-s-h-n-a or when you're calling on anyone except the name of our creator, which we're going to go over and talk about, is this really truly the case? Have all of this been hidden from you for centuries and centuries on end, if not thousands of years? And oh, let's not forget about Buddhism too, because you see Buddhism in the Baphomet Buddha right here, again, holding up the Kamsa, these hand gestures that what stem from demonic hand gestures, stem from Baphomet, satanic goat, worship as you can see right here it's no different another thing that all of these religions have in common is that they promote a sense of peace or false peace that is another thing that they promote that is one thing they have in common and a commonality and as you can see it's part of what the agenda of a one world religion blending and merging these religions together to create one big religion and you see right here the false peace sign you see how it's an inverted cross just like the swastika cross you see the cross right there again you see how it's embedded in all these different religions as we've also gone over and talked about the yin and the yang the cross right there the moon and the star the crescent moon also seen in Hinduism who is the one trying to blend all these religions together the beast the pope the vatican remember the pope at the what the multi-religious service back in september of 2015 when the pope visited america again trying to blend and merge these religions together in order to create their one world religion how could they potentially do this? Well, they can do it with Project Bluebeam as we've also gone over. And if you would like to learn more, please take a look at that video linked in the description box because with what? Project Bluebeam, it's their plan to use NASA and all those other ones to what? Fake an alien invasion and also to put these false messiahs onto the sky. So to potentially put JC in a sky coming to a sky near you, put JC in Christian regions and countries 
and put even ones like Muhammad in Islamic countries, but then Buddha in Asian countries too. Do you see where the agenda is going here? Do you see this? And then Krishna in Indian nations also. Do you see how this could be a delusion, a grand great deception to make you think that the Messiah is returning or the Avatar is returning when really it is not? And they have the technology to do this. They've been planning this for how many years, how many decades now. And yes, you should be concerned because what Shiva's right here at CERN and Shiva is what said to be the deity of destruction and with CERN. It's definitely a concern because if you actually take a look and look into CERN, you'll see that how they're manipulating things with the Mandela effect, how they're changing and altering words even as we speak, how they're changing and altering words in the scripture, how they're changing and altering names of companies and etc. And by the way, if you're partaking in that Shiva dance, that is demonic. That is a demonic, satanic dance and practice. But you need to understand that this is spiritual warfare and it's a war on the mind because portals and doorways. And the question is, are you opening up your portals and doorways, a.k.a. your mind? Are you opening it up to demons every time you give homage to these pagan idols and not to the creator? So you are probably wondering then, now what? Now what is the solution? What is the real truth? Since we have just now exposed all of these different religions and not only tied in Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and all the other ones, Jainism and Sikhism, also with Islam and Christianity, well then what can really possibly be the truth then now that we've just basically shown you that all of these religions go hand in hand and that they're the exact same thing, that they give worship to the same thing? Well, stay tuned because the truth is just ahead. Well, the first thing you're probably wondering is, well, where do I go from here? Well, step one is to recognize and understand that, in fact, you have been lied to. And I know this might be a difficult pill for many of you to swallow, but it's one that we all have to come to terms with, that we have, in fact, been lied to, as I've talked about in previous videos. And just like I told the Christians and even the Muslims in our Islam video, is the fact that there are so many lies and we've been deceived, but now now is the time to come out of these lies and to recognize them and to be deceived no more. What am I talking about? Well, if you're watching this and you're still on the fence about whether or not there's a creator or if you're agnostic or if you're atheist, or if you identified as a secular Buddhist, well, please take a look at my Flat Earth videos and also the video on China because recently China has just sent a spacecraft to the moon. So we've been told. You see how you might have been lied to? Definitely check out that video because it's so very important indeed. And again, to recognize these lies and to understand that these lies have been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And like we said, all roads lead to Rome. These are the same lies that have been infiltrated by Rome and have been spread by Rome. And even though Hinduism and Buddhism are ancient traditions and philosophies that go all the way back thousands and thousands of years, however, we have to understand that there has been a secret motive and an agenda behind all of them and now you're going to see exactly what it is and now you're going to see the truth because the truth is what makes you free. And the reason we're bringing all of this up is because the very first thing to do is well to have a relationship with our creator is to start to have a relationship with the one who made you with the one who formed you doesn't it mean the world to you doesn't it mean the world in general that the one who formed you the one who made you the one who breathed kaya life into you cares so much about you that he even has you listening to this video and has allowed you to listen to this video and to see the truth about the world that we truly live in and dwell in. And again, if you're still on the fence or still have questions, please take a look at some of our videos that are linked in the description box below for more on that. But that's what this is about, and that's what this network is dedicated to doing. And just like we talked about in the Christian video and even in the Islam videos, like we said to the Christians and to the Muslims, and now to you all also, is the fact that this is about having a relationship and returning to our Creator, the one who knows how many freckles are on your face, if you have any, the one 
one who knows how many hairs are on your head and has numbered each and every one of them. Now is the time to have a relationship with our Creator and getting to know our Creator. No, this is not like religion or Christianity where it's watered down doctrine. No, it is not like that. No, it is not a form of bondage. But just like we have relationships with our pets, just like we have relationships with our friends, just like we have relationships with our parents or with our guardians or with the people around us, with the people at our job, with the people that we work with, with the people that are our friends or associates, well, now is the time to really have a deep, intimate, close relationship with the one who made us. And by, we can start this by getting to know the name of our creator, which we're going to go over in just a moment to come. But in order to do that, we must first recognize the wrong ways of trying to realize our creator and try to get one with ourselves. Well, again, you can try to get one with yourself. And like we talked about at the beginning of this video, whether you tried yoga or meditation via yoga or chakras or any of these things, which of course stem from ancient Buddhism, ancient Hinduism, and ancient Jainism, then you'll find out and start to find some things when it comes to this. And again, we talked about the hand gestures and the mudras. Also, if you take a look at this one right here, when it comes to the seven chakras, you'll see that what? This is what? A six-pointed star, just like in Judaism. But before we move on further, really start to question the why and really start to do an evaluation, a self-evaluation, and start to wonder why, why you might be into these types of things or when it comes to meditation via chakras and yoga. Could it be because you're trying to reach enlightenment? Could it be because you're trying to reach for something higher? Could it be because you're trying to heal from previous wounds? Could it be because you're trying to heal from certain hurts that happened to you in your past? Could it be because you're trying to heal from certain things and you figure that this is the best way to do it, that this is the best path to do it. I understand exactly what you're going through and how you're healing from certain things because the reality is the world that we live in is a dark and cold world indeed. We all want to be loved. We all want to be healed from things. We all have previous hurts and pains that we've been through when it has come to our past. We all have people that have done us wrong somehow. We all have had experiences where we've been done by someone where someone has done us wrong, where someone has betrayed us, where someone has hurt us to the core. And so we start looking for remedies when it comes to these hurts. And this is not even just religion. This is just in general. We start looking to different avenues. We start looking to ways of healing. And maybe this way has even been presented to you. Maybe you've even tried this looking for fulfillment in this. And you know what? Maybe you have found fulfillment when it comes to chakras and yoga and meditation, which is Buddhism and even Hinduism. Maybe you have found some healing. But the reality is after you've reached that enlightenment, Enlightenment or after you've reached that form of nirvana, you still find yourself within that samsara, you still find yourself within that wheel, you still find yourself on that dharma wheel, you still find yourself as though you're not really being fulfilled. Yeah, you might have a fulfillment for a moment, but then right after that moment, you still feel as though you just started the meditation or the mudra or the mantra or the tantra. Because you know deep down in your soul, you're looking for something even deeper. You're looking for something even more fulfilling. What you're looking for is a relationship. What you're looking for personally, for the personal healing that you need, for whatever it is that you need, for the personal fulfillment, for the self-fulfillment, you're not going to find it here because you've tried it. Or maybe you have not tried it. Maybe you sought other avenues, but you might even get that high or you might feel fulfilled somehow, but then again, after words, it's no longer a high anymore, just like when it comes to certain people when they have to resort to drugs or alcohol. Yeah, it might be a high for that moment, but then afterwards, it's no longer a high. And it's not just with this, it's with anything else. So again, what is the solution to all of this? Because it seems as though you've tried everything. So what is the real solution? You're looking at this world and how broken it is. You're even looking in yourself and how broken you are. And so now you're trying to tell yourself, well, how can you be healed? How can you be loved? How can you be fulfilled? You may even be wondering, do you have a true purpose? Do you even have a true purpose within yourself? Maybe that is why you've been trying and experimenting different things. But the reality is this, though. 
What you're really truly looking for can only come from the one who made you and formed you. Now, I know you might have some bitterness or resentment when it comes to just the idea or thought or even skepticism when it comes to our creator. But the reality is this, though. Religion has taught us all wrong. Religion has done a number of damage to us, specifically Christianity. Because it has tampered with the scriptures, and by the way, the scriptures, or the Bible as it's commonly known, is a history book, and we're going to be talking more about that. It is not a religious text. It is not about Jewish people, nor is it about Christian people, but again, this has been twisted and tampered with because what? The enemy, Satan, does not want you to know your true creator. The enemy does not want you to know who your true creator is. They have been blocking your true creator from you for thousands of years, not anymore more and then even worse giving you these ideas and giving you these different practices such as spiritualism and new age and all of these different things when really you still find no fulfillment deep down and you're wondering how you can fill that void because it just seems like nothing is working well now this is the great news because now is the fulfillment because now you know the truth and the truth is what is making you free because it starts to feel like a drug. It starts to feel the exact same way. You're looking for something deeper and cannot fill the void, really. So it's no different than a drug when it comes to this type of thing, when it comes to these types of things. And so that is the first thing also is to what? Get away from religion, is to say goodbye to religion. No more religion, whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Sikhism, Jainism, Christianity, Islam, etc. Because what is religion? To be bound again. And no longer will your mind be bound. No longer will you be bound. No longer will you be bound to the ideas and dogmas and philosophies of these religions that are only trying to keep you bound to a weak that seems to be spinning endlessly and is not really fully bringing you the fulfillment and the joy that you really deep down are looking for. Yeah, it might for a moment or yeah, you might find it a little bit, but then afterwards it still is not filling that void. Only you know what that void is, but here is the great news. As you start to get away from religion and as you start to get away from these things, the next thing to do would be to get away from these hella days also, regardless of the religion. So with Christianity, getting away from Easter, getting away from Christmas, and we've done videos on that if you would like to take a look at that on this network and on this channel. Also, when it comes to Islam, getting away from hella days such as Eid al-Adha and all the other ones, and also with the Hajj pilgrimage, and now even in this video, when it comes to Buddhism, Hinduism, and also Chinese traditions, getting away from these pagan traditions, getting away from hella days such as Diwali, Hali, Navrati, Dussehra, Vesak, Nirvana Day, and etc including getting away from the Chinese New Year because what celebration of dragons? Are you celebrating dragons and serpents? Are these on your mind also? And also when it comes to these moon calendars, because as we've talked about in other videos, the calendars, you may have not known this, but calendars such as the Chinese calendar and even the Hindu calendar, they're based on the pagan moon calendar with origins from Babylon. And now is the time to come out of her, come out of Babylon, come out of all of these holidays and traditions and really see the truth for what it is. And this even includes other hella days embedded in Jainism, Sikhism, and all the other ones, Taoism, Confucianism, if there are any. And of course, you would know what they are because now is the time to come out of them, come out of her, my people. And this also means getting away from yoga and meditations and chakras if you're doing this or if you're learning about these things to get away from it completely because again, you are inviting yourself to demons unknowingly and inviting yourself and your body to demons to be exposed to them not anymore. Now again, we're not saying get away from meditation completely because you can meditate and study on the word, which we're going to be talking about, but when it comes to the mudras and the hand gestures, gestures and all of this stuff and imitating Buddha when it comes to these types of things, that is what we have to get away from and to get away from quick, fast, and in a hurry. 
and also get away from all of these idols get away from these things rid these things of your house rid these things from your cars no longer allow these idols to be in your home whether it be a cross on your neck get rid of it because it's what idolatry get rid of the Buddha statues get rid of the Ganesha statues and any other statues that might be in your house in your car in your shop whether you have the Maneki Neko that cat get rid of that too get rid of all those amulets and charms even when it comes to the Nazar and Islam it's time to get rid of all of that stuff get rid of the idolatry purge and cleanse yourself and again just try it if you have not tried it before because I know when it comes to different uh, religions and when it comes to like chakra cleanses well now is the time to fully be cleansed and to test it and to try it out on your own you're going to notice a difference indeed when you rid yourself when you rid your mind and when you rid your house your physical place or your car or your shop or wherever you go or even your backyard of all of these idols get rid of them completely now again if you're in an environment or an area where you live or you dwell in a place where all of this is rampant of course you cannot control what other people do however you can control what you do in your household and now is the time to get rid of all of these idols completely and what's worse is that in the mainstream media is that they've been shopped around and they've been sold as like toys in some places or they've been made into like cute carvings. Oh no, there's nothing cute about this stuff and now is the time to get rid of it and abandon it completely. Because again, our creator loves you and wants to have a real relationship with you. And we're going to be talking more about that because that's what this video is. It's not religion. It's a relationship and it's an invitation to learn more about the one who made you and formed you. Now, also, if you're also involved in ancestral worship when it comes to the Chinese folk religion in some places in Asian philosophies, it's also time to get away from that too. Because again, who are you offering up all of this incense to? Who are you offering it up to and when it comes to ancestral worship worshiping the dead who again who are you actually worshiping you see this up here what does it really symbolize and represent is the deeper bigger question also like we also talked about is now is the time to just like we said in Christianity to get out of these churches and even in the Islam video to get out of these mosques well now is the time also to get out of these Buddhist temples get out of these Hindu temples also because now is the time to know and understand what you're worshiping, who you're worshiping, and now to come out of her, my people, because this is very serious indeed. So no more going to these Hindu temples or Buddhist temples, or if they have Buddhist services, or if they have Buddhist yoga meditations, or whatever the case might be, even if they're on Sunday, sun worship, even if you identify as atheist, I'm telling you now is the time to get out of that and even get out of atheism too. And also, no beads or graven carved images, so no more of those misbehave your Islam and no more of the Japa Mala either. Now is the time to unlearn the lies and relearn the truth. And again, the first step to that is to recognize the lies and to recognize that we've been lied to for thousands and thousands of years, for centuries, and at what ancestors have inherited lies. And now to come out of those lies and to start having a relationship with our Creator and start coming into the truth. Also, the first thing to do is once again to stop calling our Creator by a title because G O D is not the, his name. G O OD is a title just as we've gone over in our Islam video if you go by Dr. Khan well doctor is not your name doctor is a title well it's the same thing with this and just like with A-L-L-A-H that is not the name of our creator either and you have probably been told this in these respective religions but also you do not need religious texts either such as Vedas or these oral traditions because what they are oral traditions oral they're what knowledge by seers we are not to go after them or to seek after them but now is the time to seek after righteousness what am I talking about and this also includes unlearning different traditions that you might have been taught even ones like reincarnation well now is the time to learn the truth even about that when it comes to what resurrection 
And again, as a final warning, remember Typhoon Trami, what that happened in Japan and this statue fell face down? What is this trying to tell you? It's trying to tell you to come out of these religions and to come out of all of the idolatry. No longer will you continue to bow down to graven images supporting and paying homage to idols that cannot talk they cannot breathe they cannot move they are just what carved out of rocks and stones and made by the works of human hands it's now time to come out of this pagan idolatry it's now time to come to the truth and see the truth for what it really is because this is a buddhist statue where in india and even the JC statues also, because it's time to come out of that too. And if you would like to learn more, please take a look at our video, The Pagan Origins of JC, so you will be deceived no more, because now is the time to learn your true Redeemer. Now here is the name of the Father, as you can see right here in the ancient pictographic Hebrew, the Paleo-Hebrew, and the modern Hebrew read from right to left. As you see, it has four letters right here, and it's pronounced Yahua, Yahua, Yahua. Although Sanskrit is a very old language, there is even an older one, which is the ancient Hebrew, which was spoken once upon a time by everyone, and then the Sanskrit came into use afterwards. But as you can see right here, this is the paleo tongue right here as you can see and it's read from right to left so this letter the name of the father is pronounced with the y and then the a ah, and then the u ya u so ya ua and then the name of the messiah read from right to left is ya usha ya usha the u shan and the ayan if you would like to learn more about this please take a look at our video linked in the description box below that's entitled what is the name of the father and the son there is also archaeological evidence to prove the name Yahua and to prove that the prophets of old, commonly known as Moses, Abraham, and during their time, and even David also in the Psalms, that they all called on the name Yahua and that it was written in the Paleo-Hebrew. And if you don't believe me, here is the archaeological proof, because right here we have the Meshach Stel, which is commonly known as the Moabite Stone. As you can see right here, the letters are very similar and written to what? The Paleo-Hebrew, as you see. But if you go to line 18, you actually see the name of our creator right here, Yahua, right there, the same four characters that we pointed out earlier ago. In line 18, you actually see the name right here. Here is a zoom in of the stone right here. As you can see, you see it says Yahua right here. This is a close up of the stone on line 18, the name right there. And I'll be sure to link all of this in the description box below so you can also take a look at it and see the truth for yourself that's right in front of you. Another piece of archaeological text that you're looking at comes from the silver stones. Now, these stones were written around the time of 625. BCE or 625 years before the Messiah, also before Babylonian captivity. Now the reason this scroll is so important is because the silver scrolls contain the book of Numbers chapter 6 verses 24 through 26. So this is what Masha or what you know as Musa or Moses would have written down during that time. And if you keep scrolling on the silver scrolls, what do you see? You actually see evidence of the name Yahua being used once, twice, three times right here. You see the name Yahua. And once again, this is quoting from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. This means that the name given on Mount Sinai, the name given to Musa or Masha Moses was in fact Yahua, as I've just shown you and even proven archaeologically speaking. But there's nowhere archaeologically to prove that Moses called on Allah or even Lord or God because those are not names, those are titles and those are not in the Hebrew languages, but rather they're in the Arabic and English languages, languages that did not exist during that time. 
And once again, languages and names are so important, just like you would not like it if I called you out of your name or called you something that's not your name. The same is true with our creator, but yet religion has told you that it's all right to call on a different name other than the name of our creator, even though this is not true. And also, like scripture tells us, test the spirits, test it and see for yourself. Call on Allah and call on Yahuwah and just try it and see which one you get a response from and see the truth for yourself and same if you're still calling on l-o-r-d or g-o-d well now call on yahuwah test these spirits and see the truth for yourself and break out of these lies and deceptions and now is the time to receive the great news of salvation and the great news of salvation is yahuwah the restored name for our creator and his son yahusha the restored name of our messiah no it is not l-o-r-d it is not G-O-D. It is not A-L-L-A-H as we have proven in this video. And it is not J-E-S-U-S -S, as we've also proven. And it is not I-S-A, but rather Yahua, Yahusha in the Paleo-Hebrew. Now is the time to receive the truth. And yes, names are very important, and this is the name of our Messiah, Yahusha, whom the builders have rejected. And now is the time to no longer reject truth and no longer harden your heart, but to allow Yahusha, our Messiah, who's knocking on the door of your heart to have an invitation with you and to sup with you if only you would let him and now is the time to open up your heart to our messiah yahusha to the father yahuwah because no one comes through to the father yahuwah except by our messiah yahusha and to have a real special relationship with our Messiah, Yahusha. And no, this is not the same as Christianity with having a relationship with JC, but rather the true Messiah of the scripture, Yahusha. Because just like we have relationships with our pets, our family members, our friends, and our neighbors, and etc., well, now is the time to have a relationship with our Creator through His Son, Yahusha. And the first thing to know is His name. And like I said, test it for yourself. Call upon his true name and see the truth for yourself and experience that real relationship that our creator wants to have with you and for you because we know the Messiah comes in his father's name and you do not receive him. If another comes in his own name, him you would receive. And we talked about that having to be JC, ISA, ALLAH, and the list goes on. But we know the father's name is Yah, Yahu, just as we've seen even in the book of Zabur, the book of Psalms. And now it is time to follow and hearken to the true words of our Father and Messiah in the scriptures, the entire book of scriptures. So not just the Torah and not just the Psalms and not just the Injil or the great news, what's commonly known as the New Testament, but the entire Old Testament and New Testament and really get a better understanding of the word and what our Father is truly saying. And we can start by the commandments and learning the law, statutes, and commandments that were given to Musa, Masha, Moses, when he was at Mount Sinai and when the children of Yasharal were delivered from the first Egypt, the first captivity, because we see we are to call upon his name, Yahua. And we can start this by keeping the first 10 commandments. Well, all religion breaks the first four commandments because the first commandments is that we are to have no other mighty ones before Yahua while having A-L-L-A-H or L-O-R-D, G-O-D, J-E-S-U-S, -S, or even ones such as Buddha and Krishna, that's breaking the first commandment. The second commandment is no graven images. And we've talked about how graven images, how the Roman Catholic Church B system, how they took out that commandment, adding and taking away, but having a graven image such as a cross, which represents the dead in Christianity, having prayer beads in Islam, Catholicism, Hinduism, and even Buddhism breaks that commandment, and also too, the hand of Fatima breaks that commandment also. 
keeping the third commandment which says not to take the name of our creator in vain while calling on a l l a h or j e s u s or any of those pagan titles that we've gone over and exposed is breaking the third commandment because our creator says that he will not hold anyone guiltless who takes his name in vain and for those who are still saying that oh it does not matter oh he knows my heart oh he understands oh we cannot learn the hebrew oh excuse here oh excuse there i'm telling you it's time to wake up and break out of these deceptions break out of these delusions right now and the fourth commandment is to keep the sabbath or the shabbat the seventh day of rest well christianity breaks that with sunday sun worship and as we've talked about the beast system known as the roman catholic church what they did is that they changed commandments adding and taking away by making a pagan day the day of worship and the day of rest when it is in fact not making it lord's day well lord just so happens to mean baal and then try to justify by saying, oh, but the Messiah was resurrected on Easter Sunday, even though that's not true either. And I've covered a video on that showing you and proving, even with the Greek itself, that the Messiah, Yahusha, was actually resurrected on the Sabbath, the Shabbat, because he says that he is the master of the Sabbath. But see, they tried to hide that from you deliberately, but not anymore. So what are we to do then? What are we now to do now that we know the truth and now that the truth will make us free? Well, we are to be immersed in the restored name Yahuwah for our father and Yahusha for the son come out of these paganisms, which are these religions and be washed from the impurities of the world known as Babylon and all of her disgusting pagan rituals and traditions. Once we have done so, we can then receive the Ruk Akadash, or what's commonly known as the Holy Spirit, and be cleansed and be grafted back into the house of Yasharal commonly known as the house of israel because yahusha our messiah says that he's only come but for the house of Yasharal, or what you know as israel and what makes someone Yasharal? Who is considered someone who is of Yasharal? Someone who is crossed over from this pagan world into the truth because the word of our creator, Yahuwah, is the truth. Yahusha is the word made flesh, the living word, and Yahusha is the way, the truth, and the kaya, the life. And if you're so-called black or so-called African-American watching this video affected by the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and or Leviticus 26, then you are actually the fulfillment in the scriptural people of the book. And therefore, now you have the opportunity to graft on to Yasharal and be regrafted in by keeping the law, statutes, and commandments. But for those who are not so-called black, is salvation available to those anyone else? Of course it is, because you can be regrafted in through Yahusha by keeping the law, statutes, and commandments that are outlined and highlighted in the first five books of Scripture, commonly known as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if you would like to learn more about who the true chosen people of scripture really are, please check out my video and my playlist on who the real scriptural people are, historically speaking, because it is not those Jewish people that you see today. That is another lie in Revelation chapter 2 verses 9 and Revelation chapter 3 verses 9 also proves that, but that they are the synagogues of Satan who say they are Yahudim or Jews and are not, but do lie. So now is the time to pray, repent, and then keep the law, statutes, and commandments so that you too can have an opportunity of eternal kaya, eternal life. And like I said, with prayer, just call out on the name Yahua and the name of Yahusha. Repent of all of your iniquities and transgressions. Get on your knees to repent indeed, and then let Yahua through Yahusha continue to lead and guide you in the way to go get you started some of the laws even include the sabbath seventh day of rest just like the fourth commandment instructs us which runs from friday evening to saturday evening so on this date because the hebrew days begin in the evening from sundown to sundown we then rest so for six days we work but then on that seventh day beginning on friday evening at sundown is the sabbath day of resting where there is to be no work and if you would like to learn more about that please 
please read Exodus or Shamuth chapter 20. And now that it's time to abandon all of these pagan hella days, even the ones such as Christmas and Easter and all of the other ones, including the ones in Islam, such as the Hajj, such as Eid al-Adha, Ashura, and the list goes on. But now we can follow the scriptural feasts that are outlined in Leviticus chapter 23. And also understanding the clean and unclean foods and the foods that are not permitted. So no more pork, no more shellfish, no more any of those disgusting foods. And you can read more about that in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. I've also covered a playlist called Torah Truth with the Torah Truth playlist where you can find even more truth about these things in the Torah. So if you would like to take a look at that, please do also link in the description box. But not only must we keep the law, statutes, and commandments that are outlined in the first five books of Scripture, we must also keep and have the witness of our Messiah, Yahusha, and accept Yahusha as our perfect Passover lamb. I know that the Quran has told you, as they call him ISA, I know that the Quran says, that the true Messiah did not die, but that he just ascended into heaven and that was it, and that he's only just a prophet and that he's not the son of our creator. I'm here to tell you that that is pure blasphemy because the scripture tells you everything you need to know about Yahusha. That is why we need to get away from the Quran and all religion, period in order to understand the truth because Yahusha is the way and the truth and the Kaya, the life. And those of us who believe in Yahusha have everlasting eternal Kaya, eternal life. So who is Yahusha? And you can read about this in the scripture. Again, this is Yahusha. This is not JC because this is the restored name of our Messiah. And no, this is not a religion. Jewish people have told you, oh, but the name is too sacred to say. They did that because they do not want you to know the truth, the restored name. So who is Yahusha, our Messiah? Yahusha is our Passover lamb. And the scripture tells you this also, that Yahusha came in the flesh. And what did he do? Yahusha atoned for all of our iniquities and transgressions. Yahusha died and was hung on a tree and was then resurrected after three days, resurrected on the Shabbat, the Sabbath, and came into the world as our Passover lamb in order to atone for all of our iniquities and transgressions and to become our perfect Passover lamb. And those of us who believe in Yahusha, with the blood of Yahusha, we too can enter into eternal kaya, eternal life. But that is only possible if we believe and accept Yahusha as our sovereign and as our savior, the one who came and who has come to save us from all of our iniquities and transgressions and to save us from the wickedness of this world. But Yahusha is more than just a mere prophet. Yahusha is the son of all. Yahusha is Yahua in the flesh indeed. And when we accept Yahusha and accept his word and accept his promise of eternal Kaya, which is the great news, the Bashura, the real great news and not the lawless JC, when we accept Yahusha, our Passover lamb, into our hearts, and when we have the Passover lamb on our doorposts, which is our hearts, then we are protected and guarded from all evil and we too have the light and can be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And we too will receive the promise and the gift of eternal Kaya and our Amuna belief in Yahusha and obedience to his word by keeping his law, statutes, and commandments and even what Yahusha instructs us to do which is to love Yahuwah, our creator, with all our heart and with all our being and with all our might and to love our neighbor as ourselves and to keep his word. And that's why the scripture tells us what transgression is. Transgression means anything that is against the law, the word of Yahuwah, also Yahusha, who is the living word, the word made flesh. And I know they've brainwashed you into thinking that this is a religion. No, this is not a religion. This is having a real relationship with our creator by calling upon his name and getting to know our creator, getting to know the one who knows the number of hairs on your head, getting to know the one who knows how many veins are in your body, getting to know the one who has breathed Kaya life into you, getting to know the one who wants to have a real special relationship with you. Does 
doesn't it mean the world to you that our true creator wants to have a real relationship with you and is opening his heart unto you and is knocking on your doorposts even as we speak wanting to have a relationship with you but the question is will you answer and accept Yahusha as your perfect Passover lamb the one who came to die and atone for all of your iniquities and transgressions so that you can live again and have eternal kaya and accept Yahusha as your sovereign and savior will you do this and get away from all the religion and paganisms so that you too can be born again of the Ruk Akadash or what's commonly known as the Holy Spirit being born again and being grafted into the house of Yasharal accepting Yahusha our Passover lamb and not JC the earth pig as our sovereign savior and keeping his laws commands and ways and accepting the truth because remember this the truth will make you free and also immersions and getting immersed in the restored names of Yahua our creator Yahusha the son and the Ruk Akadash even as we saw with Yahusha himself by Yahukanan or what you know as Yahya by John the Immerser or John the Baptist and if you are interested in this please email me at truthunveiled77 at gmail.com again my email is truthunveiled77 that's two sevens at gmail.com place immersion in the title also, if you are interested in having a copy of the scriptures that use the restored names of our creator Yahuwah and the restored name of the son Yahusha and getting away from these scriptures such as the KJV and all the other ones that still call on pagan titles, if you are interested in having these scriptures in order to better have a relationship with our creator Yahuwah through our Messiah Yahusha, please email me at truthunveiled77 at gmail.com and place scriptures in the title or if you have any questions whatsoever please feel free to email me at truthunveiled77 at gmail.com and to close this video, I would like to quote from a few verses in scripture. First in Yashayahu, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 9, where it says, Then when you call, Yahuwah would answer. When you cry, he would say, Here I am. Another one, which is Yahukanan, John chapter 8, verse 12, that says, Therefore Yahusha spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of Kaya, the light of life, because Yahusha is the way, truth, and the Kaya, the life. No one gets through to the Father but by Yahusha. There is no other savior but Yahuwah because Yahusha's name means in the Hebrew to the English that Yahuwah is salvation. Yahuwah saves. That's what the name Yahusha actually means. Now we're here in Yarm Yahu, Jeremiah 6.16, which says, Thus said Yahuwah, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for yourselves. Mathatha Yahu, Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 17. And see, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting kaya or life? And he, Yahusha, said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Alua. But if you wish to enter into kaya life, guard the commands. Debarayim, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 through 8. This is our creator, Yahuwah, speaking. And it shall be when all these words come upon you, the barakah, the blessing, and the curse which I have placed before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the nations where Yahuwah, your Alua, drives you, and shall turn back to Yahuwah, your Alua, and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your being, you and your children. Children, then Yahuwah your Alua shall turn back your captivity and shall have compassion on you, and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Yahuwah your Alua has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under the Shamayim, or what's commonly known as heavens, from there Yahuwah your Alua does gather you, and from there he does take you. And Yahuwah your Alua shall bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he shall do good to you, 
and increase you more than your fathers. And Yahuwah your Alua shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yahuwah your Alua with all your heart and with all your being so that you might live. And Yahuwah your Alua shall put all these curses on your enemies and those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall turn back and obey the voice of Yahuwah and do all his commands which I command you today. And that's how we enter into the tree of Kaya, the tree of life, by doing and keeping the commandments of our creator, Yahuwah, keeping his law, statutes, and commandments, the entire scriptures, and also the witness, Amuna, the belief of Yahusha. This is the great news, and this is the true great news, and the truth has been revealed to you today. And to love one another and to forgive one another. And that's why I've sat here and spent how many hours with you sharing with you the great news because you need to see the great news for yourself because the truth is what will make you free indeed and break those strongholds of religion that have just been exposed to you today. But if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at truthunveiled77 at gmail.com. This is Truth Unveiled here saying as always, Peace, love, and shalom.